The survivors of this cataclysm were living in darkness and, and they were suffering. And in the midst of this period of time, there appeared these men in the Andes. They were fair-skinned, they had beards, long hair, they were dressed in white cloaks, they had sandals on their feet and staffs in their hand. The people called them the Bidacochas. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop that's just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Well, well, well let's just get into this. Because... We, we, we can't seem to do intros. Now that we talk to you all the time, Tim, we, we, we don't know how to do the intro anymore. We're like, we're friends now. We, we text message. We make jokes off the air a lot. <laughs> we, we exhaust all of our creativity before we get to uh, actually start recording this show. <laughs> the pre-roll. <laughs> yeah. uh, on the pre-roll, right? Yeah. I will say, though, I, one of our goals with, with you early on in the show was we, Luke and I would talk afterwards. So we're going to crack we're gonna Tim Albert. We're going to get him to crack. We're going to get him to laugh. laugh. <laughs> And you just did. You didn't give it to us the first few episodes. I don't, yeah, I don't normally uh, not too jovial <laughs> on the podcasts, but uh, in real life, it's different. I know. No, in real life, for sure, right? I know. Yeah. Just, like, you go into lecture mode. A brunch alberino is is quite is is quite jovial. If I'm That's not right. in lecture mode, so you wouldn't Tim- get anything interesting out of me. <laughs> and here, here's this here's this professional transition for you and you could get tim in three different ways you can get him in costa rica you can get him in peru or you can get him on the podcast what will you choose luke we I, got, choose, we got, I choose we yes tim. and yes and is what we're choosing right because we you got our listeners know this we have a uh, we have a sold out trip to peru our first blurry expedition end of june um with tim alberino if you haven't listened to the show a lot tim lived for quite some time in in Peru, uh, with a pipe and a, and a, and a monkey, and and, and and dreadlocks. I mean, it is it is quite the visual. Um, someone actually painted it for us, and um, it it was uh, it was in all of its glory. So that so yeah, that would be the the blurry expedition, right? Yes, yeah. And then we had BlurryCon. You came to BlurryCon, so we had the conference, and now we now we're announcing a third. We got a new, we got something new, Tim. What do we got? An ex- excursion event. We don't know what to call it exactly yet, but we call it the Explosion. Tim, Tim just calls it an event. We right? are well. Let's put it this way. <laughs> In conversing with you guys, it, we we realize that you know your audience and my audience. One of the one of the most appealing things about these events is that they get to come together and spend time together, meet each other, and hang out. So we were just kind of thinking, where would be the coolest place for all of us to hang out together and also, you know, be able to delve deep into topics on a different level than just a normal conference. And so we decided that we want to do this in Costa Rica. And so we we programmed an event in Costa Rica for 2024, February 2nd through the 4th, 2024. And this event is going to take place in what is definitely one of the most adventurous locations in Costa Rica, the Manuel Antonio National Park. This is literally the closest hotel to the jungle. Like, it is ensconced in the jungle. 
There's monkeys climbing around the railings and everything. So they have a facility in this hotel that accommodates up to 150 people. So this is not a big event. This is more of an intimate event. It's going to be very informal. I'm going to be there, obviously, and you guys are going to be there. And we're going to be hanging out, talking about a, a variety of topics. We might have some special guests pop in talking about some a variety of topics. But what makes this difference for, different from a conference is that we're going to be able to really, really, as I said earlier, delve deeply into some topics with a lot of audience interaction. And obviously, right. we're going to be hanging around that hotel in that area you know, going on canopy walks. There's trails right into the jungle, right behind the hotel. There, the beach is right there. So you have the ocean and the jungle. And we'll be hanging out in the town there and, and, and doing some fun stuff in the area. So it's a great place to converge, to plumb the depths of certain topics that, that you know, even on a podcast, we cover so much ground in, in, in an hour and a half or whatever, but this is going to be even more in depth than that because we're going to have a lot of time to really explore some of the more controversial topics, some of the more complex topics. I might even, I'm thinking about it, nobody can hold me to this yet, but I'm thinking about even discussing, relating in a very in a very abridged manner, some of what happened to me when I was in the Amazon. This would be the appropriate location mm. to do this, believe me. So I probably will be inspired <laughs> to talk about that because we're going to be literally, as I said, ensconced in the jungle. Um, but this is not like deep jungle, you know, roughing it kind of an environment. This is like resort, beach, and the fun in the jungle. So it is like the perfect place for your guys's fans and my fans and listeners to come and converge and and just really the fans of these topics that we talk about the people who are who've been tracking with you guys and tracking with me regarding giants aliens bigfoot all of these topics will be discussed and so i think it's gonna i'm really looking forward to it it's it's gonna be a blast it's gonna be a blast so again it's from the second through the fourth of february 2024 it's taking place in the Manuel Antonio National Park. Now, if people listening to us want to actually be in that hotel, they should get tickets quickly and book their rooms as quick as they can. And we'll have information. There's You're going to get a discount because you're part of our event. So you'll get a discount at the hotel and you, we'll provide you with that information. And also, there's, there's a lot of little hotels in this area. There's really... Uh, cheap hotels like 50 50 bucks a night and then there's like some resorts so it's it's really an eclectic mix of different um different hotels from two star to to four star hotels in the area there might even be a five star hotel in the area so plus there's also a lot of airbnb rentals in the jungle there that are right in that area so it is the perfect spot to go hang out and have fun tim what i love about this idea is that really what you know what blurry creatures and and the Tim Alberino, you know, the Venn diagram, what you find in the middle is really community. And so what I think is amazing, this is really going to be an interactive, um, intimate community event, limited spots. Uh, it's it's going to be three days in Costa Rica. It's in the jungle. So what we're telling people, I, I think what we want to tell people is it's in the winter here in North America. So you can get, get away. You can kind of winter, plan, plan a, a vacation in a sense yeah. in Costa Rica and spend three days with us uh, in, the, in the national park, diving deep into the things that this community loves in a very mm -hmm. interactive and intimate way. And, you know, as Tim was saying, like, you know, book your airfare, book your, book your hotels, come and spend three days. You can spend five days a week in Costa Rica. That's really your prerogative. But these three days are going to be, are going to, are going to be direct interactive uh, interview audience participation site type podcasts topic events where we'll delve into the stuff that we do on this show with Tim and and then we're going to go and do canopy walks and, and go to go to the go into the jungle and then spend time fellowshipping together this this whole thing I think the most amazing thing about um blurry you know this little project this blurry creatures project it is the community that's grown around this and and people I, I know love the opportunity to meet like-minded folks and, and what better place to do it than in, in a warm place in February in the jungle um spending time talking about these things that we believe are so important uh, to contextualize within a biblical paradigm and, and, and within our faith. And then also, hey, 
have some fun. This is going to be fun. This, this is me- everything we do on this show is meant to be but heavy and fun. And I, and I think this sort of encapsulates that. So we're super excited. You know, we've got Peru in June, Costa Rica in February, and the Costa Rica trip is going to be a, a conference like event. Unlike any other, unlike any mm-hmm. other, it, it's not going to be stuffy, formal. It's going to be very jungle and very vacation, but also very, very deep and interactive and, and a place, a place where you can intimately talk about these things that we talk about on the show. Yeah. It's, it's going to be very informal. That's for sure. And like you said, it's vacation, I think, is the word. I'm bringing my family, my kids. We're going to be hanging out there. I'll probably be there a week early, hanging out around the little town there. And, you know, like I said, a lot of people listening to this, I'm sure, have been to Manuel Antonio. It's one of the premier spots in Costa Rica for tourists. It's super safe, easy to get to. It's, uh, you know, paved road all the way there. So you're not going to be bushwhacking. You're not going to be, you know, off-roading in the jungle. You probably to- can if you want, though, right, Tim? You could, we could probably you can if you happen. want. Yeah, and that's, you know, and, and honestly, we were talking and we said, what? how many people do we want? Before we really selected this location, we were, we were talking and trying to decide how many people do we want to come to this event? We don't want too many people because then it's going to feel like a conference. We want this to be more intimate, like a vacation atmosphere and 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 again, be able to like have a lot of audience interaction, our discussions and stuff. So we said 150 people. That's what sounded good to us. And I literally found the only hotel. I, I put my finger on the map because I've been to Costa Rica. I'm pretty familiar with Costa Rica. And I put my finger on the map in Costa Rica. If I could be anywhere in that country, I'd want to be right here in, in the Manuel Antonio National Park. And literally, there's one awesome hotel there that accommodates 150 people in a, in a conference room. So it's uh, it's a perfect location. And by the way, it's summer. February is uh, summer in Costa Rica, so it's going to be it's going to be hot right. and, and uh, should be dry, and uh, there's going to be a lot of wildlife. This is like probably this is the this is the location probably the most dense fauna out of anywhere in the world, probably in 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 the San uh, Manuel Antonio national park and there's a lot of animals in this area so if you like wildlife like i do i love monkeys and i love jungle animals and and uh my kids love these animals and so that's it's just you know it's like it's adventure it's jungle it's ocean and it's fellowship and again going deep into these topics it's like a cruise we just don't get on a boat without the boat yeah we eat together (laughs) and and we hit the pool yeah all that Maybe I will get into what happened to me in the jungle. If I do, I'll, it'll be, again, it'll be an abridged version. I'm, you know, there's a lot of other topics to talk about. Got to talk about Bigfoot. Pets, and uh, right. <laughs> No, I love it. I love talk it. about aliens. I think That's sometimes, right. you know, the you know people want to get involved in the podcast and, and be more, you know, there's like this informal thing about having kind of a vacation, but hanging out with some of the... Some of the some of the people that you've come to, I know, I know a lot of our members have, have become friends with each other. So basically, yeah, it's like blurry creatures vacation. Sort of, we call it the the explosion. Just sort of like not quite the expedition, but it's still a kind of an excursion. We're going somewhere. We're going to have fun. We're going to hang out with you guys. It's like a land we'll do some, yeah, we'll do some bonfires. <laughs> Maybe we'll eat some food. <laughs> we'll we'll be at the hotel, and we're going to do a lot of deep deep podcasting. Try to get. It's something about something magical about being in the room together and that energy, and then people can ask questions and we're going to try to interact. It's going to be really fun. So, so you can get tickets first if you're a member of Blurry Creatures. Go to blurrycreatures.com/members. Become a member Thursday, May fourth, at six p.m. Central. Tickets are going on sale. All Blurry Creatures members will get an email for the ticket link at six p.m. So go become a member. We'll see you there. Yeah, we will be doing also a VIP event. Uh, probably the night before, right? The night before the conference, we'll be doing a VIP event. Probably, yeah, okay. the day before. We don't know exactly what it is yet, but we uh, we've got some really fun stuff in the works. I, th- I think Tim's gonna Tim's gonna swallow swords. There's gonna be monkeys and fire. <laughs> I mean, you can expect uh, there will be all the bells and whistles. <laughs> we we are all going to get stung by a bullet ant the day before the conference oh, and see geez. what happens the next day. This is like that. Uh, there's a TV show that was like Fear just, Factor or something. Yeah, like where yeah. And then we then we have to do a show all stung by oh, bullet ants. It's getting yeah. weird. It's turning into a YouTube. We're we're turning into a YouTube show right now. The other thing I would say is that this is going to be offered to Blurry Creatures members first. So in order to ha- to get your ticket. And to have a chance to be one of the one of the 150 to join us in Costa Rica in February. If you aren't a member yet, make sure you check that out. Go to blurrycreatures.com slash members and take a look. This is one of the perks, right? Is you get the first crack at 
at the trips we do. This is the same thing, Tim, we did with Peru. Same thing with, mm-hmm. Blur, with BlurryCon. Um, those things never hit the public, and I have a feeling this one won't either. So if, you, if you'd like to join us in Costa Rica, here's a, here's a, here's a great push uh, to, to join and become a member of Blurry Creatures. But yeah, no, we're gonna have fun. It's gonna be like if you want to plan a vacation, it's kind of like all the all the things in one. I think that's what I like about this idea. It's just everything, a little bit of a little bit of vacation, a little bit of podcasting, a little bit of paranormal, a little bit of weird, but mm-hmm. but all that stuff in fun in a fun location in a safe place and just just a bunch of people hanging out. So, but speaking of the jungle, oh boy, here we go. Great transition, we go. Nate. Love it. We got to talk about. Some things on this podcast we have not talk, talked about yet, Luke. We're always texting Tim, like, hey, Tim, give us the goods. Mm-hmm. What, have you, what have you really not talked about on a podcast before? What do you really want to talk about? How do we, get, how do we find a new angle for, uh, for the, you call us the Blurry Bros. The Blurry Bros and Tim put, put, put our minds together, and he said the Veracoaches. So I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. I don't know anything about them. But. Okay, well... <laughs> This is a very fascinating subject. I love talking about the Vira Coches. I didn't say that right. You said it better than well, me. no, you said it right. I just said it the way they would say it in Peru. You've got a great, um, you've got a great Peruvian accent. I mean, it is. <laughs> I have a jungle. I have a hillbilly jungle Peruvian accent, actually. But uh, this is a subject that is fascinating. Uh, I don't often get a chance to talk about it because I'm always talking about you know giants, aliens, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, on on shows all the time or theological topics, which I also love talking about. But but this is a topic I just never really get a chance to talk about. And as everybody knows, as you guys said in the beginning, I, I lived in Peru for 10 years. I lived in the jungle. I was up in the Andes. I was all over Peru. I lived there both uh, before I was married and then also after I was married. Uh, my wife and I lived in a city in the city of Terrapoto. Two of my kids were born there. Two of my kids are Peruvian uh, American citizens. And so I've had a lot of experience. Uh, I loved hanging around. One of my favorite things to do wherever I went was to hang around with the old timers, the ancianos, as they call them in, in, in Peru. Just hanging around with these guys. And I hear a lot of stories. A lot of the, my friends in Peru, these, these older guys and, and gals were hunters and, and uh, would, would trek deep into the mountains. And then also, you know, I have colleagues who've worked in Peru, like, Anselm P. Rambla. Maybe some of you are are familiar with Anselm P. Rambla. He's a Spanish explorer and researcher. Uh, I, I featured him. He was featured in the True Legends films. Mm. I forget which one off the top of my head here. One of the True Legends films that Steve Quayle and I produced some years ago. And Anselm has been a, a, a good friend of mine ever since. I've been on expeditions with Anselm I, I have some upcoming films here that uh, are going to be released before long, actually, in the spring, probably late spring, early summer. And uh, I've gone up to look for lost cities in the Andes with Anselm. And and we've we've explored the desert of Paracas and, and the megaliths of Cusco. And Anselm's an amazing guy because we have to lay some uh, a little bit of historical groundwork here. The epicenter of the Inca Empire was a particular temple in Cusco where we're going in June and we'll actually be here we will be in this location it it's it's called the Coricancha mm. and the Coricancha is a Quechua word it means the place of gold the Coricancha because the walls of the Coricancha were lined with plates of gold and silver because within the Coricancha this was the primary temple the premier temple of the Inca. This was the epicenter. It was it was both the, the religious center and the center of the Inca state was the Coricancha, the place of gold. And within the Coricancha, they had various little temples inside. And one of the temples was the Temple of the Sun, which the sun was represented with gold. And then there was the Temple of the Moon, which was represented with silver. Mm. And so you had silver and gold covering the walls. And in fact, they had a garden outside uh, of the Coricancha that was full of of life-size figures of animals and people, life-size, that were cast in pure gold and pure silver. It, it was just loaded with treasure, gold and silver. And and the, the conquistadors caught wind of the fact that this temple existed and that uh, there was this incredible amount of treasure there. So, But the story goes that when Atahualpa was captured, and this is, I won't go too deep into the history because it'll take up the whole show, but 
when the Inca emperor, the Sapa Inca Atahualpa was, was captured in Cajamarca, for those who know the story, familiar with the story, it's a fascinating story, This this uh, the history of the conquest of Peru. You had Francisco Pizarro with about 176 or so uh, Spanish conquistadors, and they they marched to the city of Cajamarca, unopposed by the Inca. And this is going to factor into what we talk about in a little bit. So I'm laying some historical groundwork. I'm, I'm, this is going to tie into Anselm in a minute here. So I, I haven't lost my train of thought. I'm, I need to I need to lay this foundation. So Pizarro marched his conquistadors, again, unopposed, up to one of the major Inca cities called Cajamarca. They found that the city was deserted. There was nobody in the city. And the reason why there was nobody in the city is because the Inca knew they were coming. And the king, the Inca, the Inca emperor, the Sapa Inca, as they called him, the Inca king, Atahualpa, had gathered his army uh, on the mountains, on the hills surrounding the city. And all of the villagers were out encamped with the Sapa Inca. And so Pizarro and his conquistadors marched into Cajamarca. They took up residence in the central square. Again, Cajamarca is an Inca village, an Inca city. And long story short, fascinating tale, look it up, but I would direct everybody to um, the book, uh, The Conquest of Peru by, I always forget his name, the most eminent American historian, and I always forget, Prescott, by Prescott, who also wrote a fascinating book about the conquest of the Aztec. And the, the story that he tells is just absolutely fascinating. So I really commend everyone to, to his work. So long story short, Atahualpa, um, there's a reason why Atahualpa is waiting, the king, the Inca king Atahualpa is waiting for the conquistadors to arrive. There's a reason. We're going to get to it in a little while. So just let's put a pin in it right there. There's a reason that we'll talk about. But eventually he comes into the city of Cajamarca with his with his royal procession with dancers and music makers and and all the pomp and circumstance. And he comes, thousands of, of Inca cram into the central square to confront the, the Spaniards. Not, not to confront them militarily, by the way, rather to greet them or to be greeted by them really. But the Spaniards, again, long story short, they trained their guns and their cannons on Atahualpa and his and his litter. Atahualpa was being carried in a litter. And uh, they rushed all of a sudden, they rushed in. There's a reason why they did this. It's in the story. Basically, Atahualpa threw a, was, was handed a Bible by a priest and he threw it on the ground. And that was the justification for Pizarro and his men to attack, which they did. And they charged and they fired the cannons into this crowd of Inca. And of course, the arquebusieres and the and the swordsmen charged and they captured the Inca king, the Sapa Inca, Atahualpa. They captured him off of his litter. And uh, this is when they they found out that there was this place called the Coricancha, this place of gold, where this tremendous wealth was, this tremendous amount of treasure, gold, silver, and probably other precious metals and gems and so forth. And then what proceeded was what's called the ransom of Atahualpa. Once the Inca king, by the way, was captured, the, the empire froze. The Inca empire had 10 million subjects. It was huge. But before Pizarro got there, they were, a lot of the empire was wiped out by, a lot of the citizens were wiped out by smallpox, other European diseases, and they had just concluded a civil war. Atahualpa versus his brother Huasca and Atahualpa won. So now Atahualpa is captured by the Spaniards. And uh, again, what proceeds is is the ransom of Atahualpa in which uh, Pizarro has the Inca king send out messages through his empire saying, we will release your king to you if you give us gold and silver. And Atahualpa told the, the Spaniards that he could fill up two rooms basically yeah. with gold and silver above their heads. And this is when they learned about the Coricancha, the place of gold and all of the treasure that the Inca had. Okay, now, fast forward. So, as I've said, the, this location, the Coricancha, was the center, the epicenter of the Inca Empire. It's extremely important to archaeology, uh, to the history of Peru, to the history of the Inca, and nobody is ever allowed to excavate in this location except Anselm Pirambla. Anselm Pirambla was allowed, he, he got permission miraculously to excavate in 
the Kodi Kancha. And Anselm was looking for something very particular when he was there. Uh, he was looking for this legendary tunnel that runs from beneath the Kori Kancha. And those who are going to be in Cusco with us, you're going to you're going to hear me tell retell this story live from the Kori Kancha. There's a legendary tunnel that runs from beneath the Kori Kancha one mile in a straight line to the galleries beneath the megalithic walls of Sacsayhuaman. Now, this tunnel is a legend. Historians do not believe it exists. It's the stuff of, of myth and legend because, going back into the historical context, the Pizarro and the conquistadors ultimately ended up killing Atahualpa. He did uh, actually fulfill his end of the bargain. He filled up the rooms with gold and silver nearly, nearly to the degree that he had indicated. But they killed him anyway. And actually, Pizarro became good friends with Atahualpa. So it wasn't like... Uh, it was a very difficult thing for him to do, but but they they couldn't leave the king of the of the Inca Empire alive as they're marching to into the heart of the Inca Empire to Cusco because that was their plan. Now they're headed for Cusco. Pizarro and the conquistadors are now marching to Cusco. They're going to seize the Cori Cancha. They're going to seize all of this treasure because they didn't feel like they got enough treasure. So the Inca priests, what do they do? They organize the sequestration of all of the most important and valuable treasures of the Inca and artifacts, religious and otherwise. And what they did was they assembled a large group of natives and they, and they took all of their most valuable possessions, especially the most sacred relics in the Cori Cancha, down into the tunnel beneath the Cori Cancha, and they hid them in the galleries, in the cave system, beneath the megalithic walls of Sacsayhuaman. Beneath Sacsayhuaman is a massive cave system, tunnel system. It's called the Shinkana. Okay, and I apologize if I'm being confusing. I'm weaving back and forth between uh, periods of time. So now, going back to Anselm Piramla, Anselm is excavating at the Cori Cancha. First guy ever really, for, see, he's a Spaniard, so um, it's really unprecedented. And it's an amusing story of how he got permission to do it, too, by the way. Anselm is excavating. What do you think he's looking for? Tunnel. He's looking for the Shinkana, the Shinkana beneath the Kodi Kancha. The Shinkana is the tunnel. Yeah. Now, we're not talking about some crude tunnel. We're talking about an elaborate tunnel lined with stone walls. So the reason why Anselm is excavating here. In, in the Cody Conch, and this was back in. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask you. I think you were about to say it because I was asked when this when this was because I know we're jumping around in yeah. the time period. Yeah. So when is this excavation I, happening? I think this was back in the nineties, okay. like ninety seven, ninety six. I, I might be wrong. I I can't remember exactly. It was it was sometime around the nineties, I believe. And this is this is something like you know I was watch, when you watch all these shows like like Graham Hancock's new show, and they have all this new technology. These underground tunnels seem to be under most of these megalithic sites, right? Exactly right. And it, and it does it does not sound unfamiliar in the sense of like it sounds a lot like what you hear about with the Ark of the Covenant, right? As as yeah. this impending invasion is happening, they are sequestering these these relics and they're placing them up. People would some would say that the that the Ark rests beneath Temple Mount, right, in these places mm -hmm. where it's hidden. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it's. Man, it sounds a lot like some of the things you hear in these other legends, right? Correct. Legends, yes, <laughs> yeah, right. So, so the reason why Anselm is digging is because some years prior he was doing excavations at Sacsayhuaman. By the way, Anselm proved that Sacsayhuaman is pre-Inca because he dug down. They did they did the archaeological trenches and he discovered pre-Inca artifacts. In the lower levels, which means, and there were stones, stone walls. So you have this, the stone walls and pre-Inca artifacts. Sacsayhuaman was not built by the Inca. Mm -hmm. So, and again, we'll be at Sacsayhuaman too. This is giving me so much, so much juice for our trip. Yeah, this is awesome. I was going to say, this is fun because you guys are going to be in these locations. So getting back to Anselm, he's, he's the reason why he's digging there. He's looking for the Shinkana is because a few years prior, Again, he was working at Sacsayhuaman, doing some archaeological digs, and he heard of the legend of the Shinkana. And so what did he do? He took a couple of his guys and he decided they're going to go over to the Kori Kancha. Now, you have to understand that, like so many other Inca temples, 
the Kodi Kancha was, let's say, was uh, it was captured by the Spaniards and then donated to the Catholic Church. And so what did they do? They built a Catholic priory and a chapel, a temple, a rather uh, a cathedral over the Inca ruins. And so today, if you go to the Kodi Kancha, you can still see the ruins of the Inca temple, but you're also going to see the cathedral of Santo Domingo. The Dominicans took over the site. And so Anselm is going to go speak with the prior of the Dominican order at the cathedral. And uh, he goes there, and the prior is there. And the prior, by the way, is the you know the head uh, religious official at the priory. And the gentleman is there, and Anselm gets an audience with him. And Anselm told him, he said, I heard a legend while I was digging at Saksaiwam, and I heard of a legend of this thing called the Shinkana, this tunnel that runs beneath from the Kodi Kancha, so beneath, basically beneath the cathedral, to the galleries beneath the megalithic walls of Saksaiwam. And Anselm said, I heard it was a legend, and I just was wondering if you had any information. And what, what happens next has never happened before. It was just uncanny. What happens next is the prior says, yes, the legend is true. Here, I'll show you. And so the, the prior takes Anselm. They go into the chapel, into the, uh, the sanctuary of the church. And I'll show you guys this location when we're there. They lift up this trap door. They move some stuff out of the way, and there's a trap door because there are crypts beneath the church. There's always crypts right. beneath these Old churches. Sounds that's like, where they buried. Sounds them. like a Dan Brown novel already. You like you open up the trap door <laughs> in the church, and there's crypts, and then guess where that goes? Well, that's well, that's where they bury. They would bury the clergy, the dead clergy, right. but also the villagers would be buried, the Christian villagers, and then they would those crypts would fill up really fast as the cities grew. But but you would you would you'd normally find the clergy buried beneath these churches in these crypts. So they so they open up this trap door, go down into one of these crypts, and Anselm has a couple of guys with him. They got flashlights. And the prior, and I hope I'm saying this right, prior, because that's what it is in Spanish. I'm just assuming that's what it is in English. When I say prior, what I mean is the the head priest at this facility. He takes Anselm and his guys over to the far end of the crypt where there's this wall like that looks like it was hastily built out of bricks. So it's sealing up a tunnel. And there's some bricks removed and some loose bricks. And Anselm asked if he could take some of these bricks away so that they could look into the tunnel and the, and the priest said they could do that. And so they removed some bricks and then they took a flashlight and they flashed inside the tunnel. And what they saw was not some crude earthen tunnel. Rather, what they saw was a exquisitely built artificial tunnel lined with megalithic blocks Mm. in the very same manner as the temple above. So you have the, the andesite blocks and it's in that trapezoidal configuration trapezoidal door so imagine like a trapezoidal door but in a tu- as a tunnel the walls are lined with stone for one mile he's flashing his flashlight in there and they see this incredible and it's big this incredible tunnel artificial tunnel and they thought my god the legend is true so at the end of this tunnel one mile we're going to be under Saksaiwaman and, and and confronted with who knows what treasures and whatever right so Anselm obviously is very excited and he and he turns to the prior and says, let me go get my guys, the rest of my team. We'll take this wall down and let's go into the tunnel. We'll document it. Let's do this. And the priest suddenly, out of nowhere, completely, his demeanor totally changes on a dime. And he says, no, 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 no. Seal it up. Seal it up. Get out of here. I should not have shown this to you. I made a mistake. Get out of here. You, you, I should never have shown this to you. There's all of a sudden, he, his demeanor changes, and he basically kicks him out, throws him out of the church. So fast forward a few years, Anselm miraculously ac- <laughs> obtains permission, acquires permission to dig in the Kodi Kancha. He's digging in the Kodi Kancha because he knows that the tunnel's there. He saw it. So he's trying to find that trap door. He's trying to find that crypt. And the whole objective, and only he, he, he and his team know this, by the way, the objective is to get in to the Kodi Kancha, or rather the Shinkana, to go beneath the Kodi Kancha to make entry into the Shinkana and enter the galleries beneath the megalithic walls 
of Sacsayhuaman. Woman. By the way, probably there are artifacts related to the real builders of that megalithic complex, Sacsayhuaman, Woman, beneath it. And Tim, why do you think, I mean, we hear this a lot, and obviously in places like Peru, the government's a little bit more lax. I remember talking to Derek from Megalithic Marvels a little bit about how when you find elongated skulls, you don't find them in America. The ones here are whisked away and re, re, re you know, just they don't exist, but you can still see them in museums in places like Peru. And they discovered some in Iran recently. Cause I know like all the mounds in America are, they're labeled Native American. And then the Native Americans say that these, we didn't build these mounds. Are the, is it in Peru? Are they the same way? Or they're like, is it socially acceptable to say that some of the stuff is bu- not, not, that depends on who you're talking to. Yeah. If you're talking to the establishment, if you're talking to the establishment, the archaeological establishment pushing the conventional narrative, they're going to tell you that the Inca built everything up there, uh, all the all of the monumental building. Most of it was done by the Inca. The Sacsay Woman um, was built by the Inca with conventional means, by means of you know pulleys and. Uh, rather ropes and uh, thousands of men and and ramps earthen ramps and and copper chisels and hammers stone hammers um that's like Egypt that's the story yeah. that's the story you're going to get from them and 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 they are even more entrenched than we are here you think the smithsonian's bad try dealing with the ministry of culture in peru i mean it's a nightmare that's why I'm saying the fact that Ansem got permission to, to dig in the Cody Concha is miraculous. It really is. Is it is it because you know like this sort of proves the golden age and the and the and the age of No, it's because in Peru it's the the conventional narrative the, 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 this is this is people's livelihoods and it's their pride. These are the intellectual historians and anthropologists and archaeologists. They're above everyone else. They're the keepers of the true history. And the narrative, they govern the narrative, and and they have the degrees. They went to the prestigious universities in Lima and elsewhere, and they're the gatekeepers. They have their positions in the various faculties and so forth re- relating to their professions, yeah. and they're guarding that jealously. And jealous is the right word. They don't. They they all want to be the eminent archaeologist yeah. or the eminent anthropologist or historian in Peru. It's 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 worse, way worse than America. Well, it sounds like it sounds like Zahi Hawass out in, in Egypt. The way that he it's, it is very yeah. much like that. It is very much like that in Cusco, especially in Cusco, especially. So, but I want to. We saw this recently go ahead, go ahead. with with Graham Hancock. I mean, they were saying he, they that he, all that is dangerous. They were using words like that because he was oh, yeah. he was pissing off these people all over the world because he was he basically yeah. throws out like eight different locations. And all the all the experts in those areas are just they hate them, and they I, I mean you, you know you never see a documentary on Netflix come with so much like this is this is this is the most dangerous documentary. <laughs> I'll give you an example of how bad it is. Okay, yeah, really really quick an insert here, and then I got to get back add an addendum on what I said earlier. But when I was in Peru, I was getting I was pulling permits to film. We were filming a bunch of stuff in Peru recently, not not when I was doing the True Legend stuff, just a few years ago on new projects. I'm pulling permits to film in Cusco. I'm pulling permits to film at Machu Picchu. I'm pulling permits to film in Paracas, all over the place in Peru. And I encountered, there's a company, there's like these fixer companies that help you do the permitting in Peru. Hmm. And the biggest one, I don't remember the name of it, but the biggest one was run by the nephew of the Minister of Culture. And he called me. Because we were permitting for the show for our for our documentary series, TV show, whatever it's going to be, and he called me and he started to grill me with questions. Mm. He, I guess he looked me up online, probably starting to grill me with questions. He said, "What are you going to talk about in your film?" Now, keep in mind, this guy is not an archaeologist. He's not a government official. He's he he has a company, a business, a permitting business. He facilitates the permitting. And they're they're probably the best company in Peru, the, the 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 most well known that a lot of the big companies use to do this. And he's just grilling me. What what are you going to do? What are you going to talk about? And then he said, I said, well, we're going to go to some of these locations, and we're just going to talk about the megaliths, and we're going to talk about the Inca, and blah blah blah. So I'm trying to be pretty general, very general about what we're what we're doing. And all of that is true, right? Um, and he said, who are you going to say built the megaliths? 
And I said, why does that matter to you? Your job is to give me the permit or not. Hmm. He said, are you going to talk about giants? Wow. And again, I said, I said, what does that matter to you? I said, you can approve or deny work or rather you can choose to work with us or not there's other companies available um i told him i said we what we film is our our business mm -hmm. we can go film whatever we want i mean we can go shoot a bunch of videos for instagram if we want right, right? so and he just he got really aggressive he got really aggressive he's like i know who you are i know what you talk about he said aliens didn't build the the temples and megaliths in peru why are you taking away from our heritage and i said i don't believe aliens built the megaliths in peru number one so you don't you don't know what i believe and i said i've i have no intention to diminish your heritage that being the heritage of the inca and he just went off he went off he was cussing at me he said i am the nephew of the minister of culture he said, my uncle would not approve of your narratives, and I'm going to talk to him and make sure you never film a single minute of footage in this country. And he just went off on me. And he went off about, you know, we're, we're colonizers, and we're changing the history of Peru, and we're diminishing the cultural her heritage of the Peruvians by saying that their ancestors didn't build the monuments and, and accusing me of a bunch of stuff I don't believe. He was, he was obviously conflating my perspective with that of the ancient aliens folks and and those guys had been there filming and so he was familiar with them uh, uh. and uh so but there was no there was no arguing with this guy he was he was irate yelling at me on the phone and uh i had some choice words for him as well but <laughs> um he hung up with me saying i'm calling my uncle i'm kicking you out of this country you're not filming he's like you're not going to film a single minute in my country wow he's like i'm going to make sure you don't get permits for anything so that's that's the hostility in Peru, okay? Yeah. And I don't encounter that hostility here. You encounter it kind of on a subliminal level, not so direct. Sometimes you might if you're dealing with Smithsonian people, but for the most part, you, that that kind of aggression is is rare in the United States. It's not rare in Peru. I mean, you will get archaeologists if they hear you talking and they're walking around doing a, a like if they're doing a tour let's say in the in the Kodi Kancha, and they hear me talking about the Shinkana, for example, they'll come over and start yelling at us mm -hmm. and telling us we don't know the true history. We're we're bastardizing the history and so forth. It's bad. It's mm -hmm. really bad. Okay. And I've done a lot of work in Peru. All right. So that will kind of gives you an idea of how bad it is. Now, this addendum that I wanted to add on, you asked me what the people think in Peru about the megaliths. Yeah. Well, I told you what the establishment thinks. Now, let me tell you what the actual people think. The Quechua people, the native people, the ones that you see in the colorful clothing, the ones that still practice their traditional cultural practices, their customs. Um, if you ask them, and they speak Quechua, that's their first language, their primary language. The, the Spanish is their secondary language. Some of them don't speak Spanish. Hmm. If you talk to them, or if you go up like around Lake Titicaca in the Altiplano, and you talk to the Aymara people, the, the ancient native people, the Aymara people who speak Aymara, and you, and you talk to them, you're going to get the same answer. Both the Quechua people and the Aymara people will tell you that the, megalith, that the megalithic monuments in Peru and Bolivia were, were built by a race of giants in the primordial age. That's what they'll tell you. And they'll tell you that these giants were evil and that the god Viracocha had to destroy them in a flood. Mm. That is what they will tell you. Wow. So Sounds somewhat familiar, Tim. Well, those are the conflicting narratives. And obviously, the conventional archaeologists will, will scoff at that and say, oh, those are just legends. Okay, legends like the Shinkana, okay? Because Ansem's digging, to lo looking for the Shinkana now. But guess what? When he goes back with when he gets permission to, to to go and excavate, he goes to try and find that trap door. He, you know, he knows where it is. So they bring ground penetrating radar in there, just the the old school drag mm -hmm. on the ground technology. The old lawnmower. He just the knows. lawnmower, yeah. that's right. And what do they find? <laughs> the crypt is filled in with debris. Wow. Somebody filled it in. Since he had seen it, somebody filled it in. This is like so long story short with Anselm, 
he couldn't get into it because it had been filled in. So he he couldn't finish. He couldn't accomplish his his goal because he, he eventually got kicked out. But uh, that's a whole kind of a funny story. But but Anselm discovered something really important in the Shinkana. He was digging deep under the foundations of the church and of the temple, right? And what did he find? He found that the foundations are green diorite megalithic. So the Kori Kancha had been built, and this is definitive, had been built on top of an older megalithic site with larger stones, green diorite foundations. Green diorite megalithic. Green diorite megalithic. Don't they use that to build some of those sarcophagus too? That green, I, I felt like. That's yeah, I think they do. Yeah, it's very hard stone. And when Anselm was under there, under the church, making these tunnels and stuff, uh, one of the uh, priests was uh, under under there inspecting, and they realized that Anselm had exposed one of the primary support beams of the church. And uh, and they freaked out. They said, "You're going to knock this whole church down. Wow. What one false move, and and this thing comes down." Mm. And so that led to a series of incidences, which ultimately led to Anselm and his team being expelled <laughs> from the Cote Concha. But not before the the Queen of Spain came to visit him, and he toured around with her and showed her the you know what he was doing. There's pictures of this, and the president of Peru came, and so he, you know, they were coming to see. The excavations he was doing, these unprecedented excavations, it was a big deal in Peru. And so that's who Anselm is, and that ties into to, to where we're going. So let me now talk about, before we talk about the Vita Coches, let me, let me put a bow on this story. So I'm in Peru with Anselm a few years ago filming, but I, I went to Peru with a new piece of technology, a technology that me and my partner Gary Haven possess. It's called, it's a ground-penetrating radar actually it's two radars that operate off of a drone platform and it's state-of-the-art technology and it's it's incredible this this technology can penetrate over 100 feet wow. uh, or rather i should say it can penetrate to depths in excess of 300 feet 100 meters 300 feet so this technology we have this can penetrate ground penetrating radar to depths in excess of 300 feet uh, and then we also have a shallow antenna. So we have a, we have another antenna that we can attach that is high resol higher resolution. It can pick up a quarter buried 15 feet under the ground. So we have a, the, that one's high resolution. That's we use that for looking for artifacts. The the deep penetrating antenna we we use to look for structure, tunnels, temples, and stuff under the ground. And we're using this in Peru. Now, you cannot fly a drone in in Cusco. They won't give you the permission. They'll give you maybe uh, uh you can fly a uh, a little drone for filming, but you can't fly this technology we have. You know, it's pretty bulky. It's a big drone and so forth. And so what we decided to do is like, we're not even going to bother with the permitting. They're not going to give it to us. So you know what we did? We took our antenna, one of our antennas, and we put it in a duffel bag. And and our guys walked around the Cote Concha in it with it in the duffel bag. Love that. What do you think we're looking for? Tunnel. We're looking for the Shinkana. The tunnel. Because yeah. we know where it goes because Anselm showed me. He said, this is where it goes. This is how the, it, it goes under the street here, and it goes a beeline to Sacsayhuaman. So we're focusing on that part, but we walked all the way around. And guess what we found? We found the Shinkana mm. with our ground-penetrating radar. Really? We found the Shinkana. And you know what shape it had? Trapezoidal. Mm. Wow. Just like the doorways in the Cote Concha, just like what Anselm said. It's there, clear as day. It's not a legend and we're us and Anselm P. Rambler, the only ones in the world who know it's real. That's wow. awesome. It's real. It's awesome. So well, in our June trip to Peru, are we going down in the Chincana or what? Is that part of the part of the secret? Is that the, you know the what VIP? Means? <laughs> I do. Well, you might want to rethink that. You know what Chincana means? It's a catch-all word. It means the place where one gets lost. Oh, wow. Sounds like a it's like a it's like a labyrinth. It is a labyrinth, and people there's I don't have time to go into these stories because we won't get to the Vita right. coaches. But but we'll talk about them in, in Cusco. 
but people have some people have made it in there. Not in this one, okay? There is the Chincana. It's called the Chincana Grande, which is this tunnel, this particular tunnel from beneath the Coricancha to the galleries beneath Sacsayhuaman. That's a one mile corridor, and it's artificial, okay? But then there's there's the general Chincana. The general Chincana is a mythical system of tunnels, massive tunnels under the Andes Mountains. And these tunnels are supposed to go all the way deep into the Amazon, all the way up to Ecuador, all the way down through Bolivia to the coast. Huge tunnel system, artificial tunnel system that incorporates the naturally occurring galleries and so forth from the magma and all of that. But artificial tunnels... And we're talking about, if this is real, I know the Chincana Grande is real, the, the one that we've been talking about, the artificial one. But if this larger Chincana system is real, then we're talking about advanced technology and advanced, a highly advanced civilization that would have made this, okay? And that leads us into the topic of the Vita Cocha. So before I dive into the Vita Cocha, do you want to, you have any questions yeah, or thoughts? Like a, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. Building, they're building dumbs back in the day. Well, yeah, I was going to say like Lord of, I mean, that's it's, exactly what it is. It's it like is. the dumbs like, or, or Lord of the Rings, man. They go into the mountain to see the dwarves or just open the door. It's wild. I mean, just on our show, Tim, just like just scratching the surface, there's rumors of the same thing in, you know, the Grand Canyon. They found some of these things underground. Death Valley. They were supposedly under Los Angeles. There was a. There was a there's these you know the Denver airport even Mount Shasta we did a whole episode on how the you go inside there's like this city under Mount Shasta what why why are they building these it seems like they're all over the place these lost cities underground what are they doing under there I mean because okay now you're getting into the they and that's where we're headed yeah. so <laughs> associated with the legend of the Shinkana now. Uh, Keep in mind, please, when I say chincana, there's two chincanas. There's the mile-long one that I've been talking about that Anselm saw and we confirmed with our GPR. And then there's the greater chincana, the large, huge, thousands of mile long tunnels and, and caverns and who knows what under the Andes, okay? Associated with the larger chincana is the legend of the Vida Coches. And... Uh, the Vita Coches are an advanced race of entities. This is, and now, mm. now we're getting into Andean legends. Okay. So I'm not just pulling this out of my butt. I mean, this is Andean legends. The Vita Coches are these advanced beings who, according to legend, were in the Andes a long time ago. And when I say according to legend, I'm talking about the, the Quechua legends and the Aymara legends. The Andean legends in general. And they're the same in Peru and Bolivia and Ecuador. They're the same. You'll find these, and you'll only find these legends if you talk to the old timers and to the native people. They will talk about this. The younger people have no idea about this stuff anymore. Now, when I say be the coaches, it gets complicated because one of the primary deities, if not the supreme deity of the Inca, is be the cocha. So if you type in Vida Cocha on the internet, you're going to find, you know, that this was the creator God and so forth. And indeed, it's Vida Cocha who sent a flood and killed the first race of giants, who, who he created, by the way, according to the story. They were stupid and evil. So Very he, familiar he killed story. Them with a flood. Very familiar story. Yeah. He on. killed them with a flood. Yeah. They were the first race of, of, of people. Now, this, my God, we could go for three hours. Oh, by the way, you want to hear the extended version of this? Go to Costa Rica. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So... I, I've got so many trails shooting off on different cool stuff to talk about in regard to the Giants. There's so much cool stuff in Peru about the Giants, but we're not talking about the Giants right now. We're talking about the Vida Cochas. So this is the creator god of the Inca, Vida Cocha, singular. But there's also the Vida Cochas. So this confused me for a long time in Peru. Like, what? I don't understand what the difference is. You have Vida Cocha, and the archaeologists will talk about Vida Cocha, the god Vida Cocha, but then the the Andean people will talk about the Vida Cochas, plural. Mm. It's like, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. So the, the legend of Vida Cocha, the god, the Inca god, is that he's the creator god and so forth. And I told you the giants and the flood and so forth. Okay, that's Vida Cocha, the primary god of the Inca. There for, for a while the Inca were worshiping the sun god uh Inti, but ultimately they switched to Vida Cocha. 
interesting, by the way. That's very interesting. But as I said, I would be going in the Andes and talking to the old timers and to the Quechua people, the Aymara people, and they would be telling me about the Bida Kochas. And I would be confused, like, oh, whoa, 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 you mean the god Bida Kocha? They would say, yes, the Bida Kochas. I don't understand what you're saying. But over the years, and then also my friendship with Anselm, and Anselm is steeped in this, I began to understand. And then, of course, consulting the legends and even some of the historical stuff in Peru, I began to realize that there's this, this very powerful legend in the Andes, ubiquitous, ubiquitous among the Aymara and Quechua peoples, that a long time ago, during a time of great chaos and darkness, in the aftermath of some great cataclysm that obliterated the old world. Might have a show on that. The survivors of this cataclysm were living in darkness and, and they were suffering. And in the midst of this period of time, there appeared these men in the Andes. They were fair-skinned. They had beards, long hair. They were dressed in cloaks, white, white cloaks. They had sandals on their feet and staffs in their hand. Mm. The people called them the Bidacochas. Their leader, they called Contiki Biracocha. He was their leader. And he had a company of other Biracochas with him, these bearded men. And by the way, some of the accounts say they had blue eyes. They were very fair looking individuals, you know, almost like Mesopotamians or something. And the Biracochas, again, appeared in this time of chaos and darkness. And they began to go throughout the Andes, civilizing the survivors of this cataclysm civilizing the primitive people of the Andes. And in some of the tales are quite specific. They were teaching the Andean people that they, they should love one another, treat each other amicably, that they should set up systems of law and justice and so forth. They were teaching the, they were civilizing these people. But it's not just civilizing because some of the stories talk about these individuals performing miracles. In fact, I'll get very specific. I've heard one of the legends says that Contiki Biracocha, the leader, he went walking through the Andes from village to village, teaching, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind. Hmm. He spoke every dialect better than the natives. And the people called him Contiki Biracocha. And he and his company went through the Andes, again, civilizing the, the populace. Okay, there are various versions of that story throughout the Andes, but those are the basic details. Now, there's something, I don't, man, I don't know if we have time to talk. There's so much to talk about here because there's, there's so much weird stuff associated with this. I'm trying to get to the, to the most interesting part, but Biracocha, Contiki Biracocha, he took a very specific route through the Andes, according to legend. In fact, to this day, it's called the Path. A bit of coach. I'm going to show you something. This is a document that's very difficult. I don't know if you can see this to get. Do you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. La Ruta. La Ruta de Huiracocha. That means the path of Biracocha. And uh, this is uh, a little book that was written by Maria Schulten de Ebneth, who was an eminent anthropologist in Peru. And she discovered in this legend of Biracocha, she discovered this incredible what would you call it? Geodesic mathematical alignment in the Andes. That's mind blowing. And I've got a film coming out that I, where I talk about this. And basically, according to the legend, Biracocha, he went, he and his company all went in different directions. He sent some of his cohorts, you know, to the, in, to the four different directions that make up what's called the Tawantinsuyu, the empire of the Inca empire. The Inca empire was divided into four sectors, which were called collectively the Tawantinsuyu. And they're divided along very specific lines, Lines, by the way. The city of Cusco, man, I just keep getting off on these rabbit trails. These are rabbit <laughs> trails. These are not the thing. I'm, the city of Cusco is divided into four parts. And in fact, in during the time of the Inca, so it's 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 divided into four sectors, and each sector belonged to a different native community that the, the, that the Inca had conquered. By the way, all of these native people, I said there were 10 million subjects in the Inca empire. 
they were not the Inca. They were all members of their various uh, tribes, their, their various groups, right? They were not the Inca. When you say Inca, you're only referencing the ruling class. Mm. That's it. Inca refers only. Now, this is traditionally. This is not in conventional history. We're talking about traditionally. Inca only meant the royal class, the bloodline of the Inca. And the Inca were taller than the rest of the natives. They had fairer skin. And there are some indications, some indications that they might have had elongated skulls, some of them. Okay, so there's some indication of that. I haven't personally confirmed that, but I don't find it difficult to believe. So let me just put it out there with an asterisk. They might have had elongated skulls, might have, or at least some of the members of this bloodline. The Inca were wiped out. The Spanish wiped them out. That bloodline was wiped out. It was uh, it was genocided. So the Inca is the ruling class. And the Inca say that they receive their authority, their governance from, from deep antiquity. And that it was their ancestors who were the offspring of the gods who built the megaliths. Mm. Okay? So all of this sinks. It all sinks with the things that all of your audience is familiar with, with these other stories. Mm. So returning to the path of Bitacocha very, very quickly, because it's extremely complex, the path of Bitacocha. By the way, this was very difficult to find, and it was expensive to acquire. There are not many of these left. This is uh, Maria Scholten Diebnitz's booklet that she put together for a conference she gave in Peru. Uh, so returning to her work, she discovered, and she discovered several geodesic lines geodesic mean they run topographically over the surface of the earth straight lines that are very interesting but we're going to focus on one the path the primary arm of the path of Bitacocha. so this according to legend is the path that Bitacocha took through the andes now what you have to understand about this path is it is a straight line through the andes topographically okay and it and it is oriented precisely along the 45 degree angle west of north through the Andes mountains. And the path begins in Bolivia. It goes through Tiwanaku in Bolivia, and then it makes its way all the way through the most important, all of the most important Inca and pre-Inca settlements and temples and monuments. Okay, understand what I just said. All of the most important settlements, Temples and monuments of the Inca and the pre-Inca civilizations are situated precisely along this line. And furthermore, they're all separated by precise units of measurements in term of, of measurement in terms of their distance. Okay. Just think about that for a second. Through the Andes, one of the most rugged inhospitable places in the world, the, the high Andes, right through them, this geodesic line, these major Inca and pre-Inca settlements are positioned exactly on the line, except for two instances, okay? Exactly on the line, I'll mention those two instances in a minute, exactly on this line, 45 degrees west of north, and they're separated by precise units of measurement. Hmm. That's impossible for primitive people to do that. Uh -huh. Literally impossible. And the unit of measurement, it's called the American unit, and it was discovered by Maria Schulten Diebnith. And it's and it's it's very, very, very complex, highly mathematical, and it is mind-blowing. Okay. So somebody a long time ago, probably at least back to 3000 BC, somewhere around there. And there's reasons why Schulten, Maria Schulten believes that the architects of this of this line, um, I've got it right on the tip of my Engineers. tongue. Engineers. I can't remember. Um, the art, let's just call them the architects. The mathematicians. These ancient, ancient architects yeah. who devised this path. And right, and, and keep in mind, there's megaliths along this path, okay? Megalithic sites. Some of the most important megalithic sites, like Saksai Waman, like Tiwanaku, are right on this line. So and she ha she has a reason why she believes that the builders, the architects uh, of this of the path of Bitacocha, were uh, were doing this sometime around three thousand BC, somewhere in there. Okay. Now remember, this is according to legend the path of Bitacocha, the path he took through the Andes, and then he went out over the sea, 
And it was promised, he promised that he would return. He and his company and his consort of Bida Coches, so Contiki and the rest of his Bida Coches, promised that they would return one day. So the gods, okay, these people were viewed as gods by the populace, obviously. That the gods, it was known in the Andes that the gods, the Vita Coaches, who once appeared in the Andes and did these amazing things and then passed through the Andes out over the sea, that one day they would return again from over the sea. Hmm. That's a very important point. They're going to return again from over the sea. So um, there's a lot more that can be said about the path of Vita Coach. By the way, before we move on from the path of Vita Coach, I wasn't planning about ta- planning on talking about the path of Vita Coach. There are two locations that are slightly offset from the path by exactly the same degrees of, of this unit of measurement, the American unit, 14 American units, exactly. One of them is on the left side of the Andes, if you're oriented north, and the other one is on the right-hand side of the Andes. The one on the left of the Andes, that's four American units. It's, uh, it is considered to be on the line, by the way, but it's just offset a little bit. That one is called Machu Picchu. Uh-huh. The one on the other side of the Andes, up in the north, that one is called Tauripunku. And me and my team are the only ones who know about it. So Tauripunku, aside from the villagers who live up there, we discovered this lost city in the Andes called Tauripunku, which is a mirror image of Machu Picchu on the other side of the mountains, oriented along the path of Viracocha. That's in a film as well, um, uh, an upcoming film. So uh, Tauripunku and Machu Picchu appear to be mirror images of each other on opposite sides of the Andes Mountains. Tauripunku, though, so far, I have not discovered any monumental building. There's lots of ruins out there, but they're primitive. It's not like uh, Machu Picchu where you have these megalithic foundations. So far, we've only found primitive ruins, but they're extensive. Okay, And at the, the, the location of Tauripunku, which, again, nobody knows about except for me and my team. Mm. So well now everyone knows, Ansel, everyone knows Tim but yeah and Anselm yeah. and Anselm Piramble well, I didn't tell you where it is <laughs> so across the Andes mirror um, image you can find Google yeah, Earth go, that, yeah somewhere in Come the Andes slurps. there you go yeah. <laughs> spend the next hundred years trying to find yeah. it now so okay so now you understand somewhat and I've just outlined the main details of the Vida Coches Tim, Tim real quick like when when you when you talk about this and coming from over the sea if you have if you haven't watched, we took Graham Hancock brought the film up. Nate brought it up. If you haven't watched this film. This is like the, his crux, right? Like Graham is, he has so much right. I feel like, but he's so anti Bible and anti God of the Bible. But he has this whole, this enlightened traveler comes over the sea and civilized. I mean, we, yeah. we, we Osiris, yes, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the yeah in the aftermath of the Younger Dries Impact, correct event. Right. That's what he would say. And, and I don't know that I would disagree with him. By the way, on this point. No, but um, it, if it's not, gosh, it's, just, it, it's so biblical. It, it, it is well. I mean, the the yeah, the obviously the correlation with the giants and the flood and all this is unmistakable. Yeah, with the biblical material and also the ancient Sumerian uh, cylinder seal material and and the legends, uh, flood legends from all, from all over the world. Right, well, it, and, you, um, and you have you have the 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 rebellion and the Watchers and Deuteronomy thirty two and the dividing the nations and the territorial spirits and you have these entities that are then. Well, you know, taking dominion and setting themselves up as gods to be worshipped. I mean, right? I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you right up front, Luke, that I have no idea who the Vita Coaches are. Just, I have no idea. Sounds okay? familiar, Nate, or Nate uh, and, and Tim, but yeah, I don't, I'm not saying you do. But, but it could be a lost race of elves. No, we're, dude, <laughs> no, we're not doing, we're not turned on that path. Don't, well, don't let them do I'll that. I'll tell Tim. you why. <laughs> it, but it gets weirder, okay? Weirder. So. So going back into the historical context, remember we talked about the Aztec, the conquest of uh, the Aztec and then the con- it down in Mexico and then the conquest of, of the Inca in Peru. Well, those happened about a decade apart. So you had you know the conquest of Montezuma and the Aztecs in the early 1520s, and then you had the conquest of the Inca uh, via Francisco Pizarro and the conquistadors who overthrew Altahualpa sometime in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1530s, okay? So they're, they're closely related, but what's really interesting is that in both cases, you had a small group of, of conquistadors. You had a small group of guys, just a couple hundred guys, that conquered these massive empires mm. with huge armies. How did they do it? Well, the first answer is yes, they were 
preceded by disease. Yes, smallpox and so forth. And then in the case of Inca Empire, there's civil war. But putting that aside, there was still a massive army in Peru. And the the passes that the conquistadors had to cross, had to traverse in Peru to get to Cajamarca and then to get to Cusco, were narrow passes on mountainsides. And it's only 175 guys, and they're carrying heavy equipment. The Inca could have easily destroyed them just by hurling down boulders on them as they were crossing these passes. They could have obliterated them. There's no question about it. The Inca could have descended on them in one of these dangerous during one of their the while they were traversing one of these dangerous passes and knock them off the cliff they could have they could have had 10,000 indians you know hurling uh stones at them and and slinging stones at them knock them off this cliff they could have done it but they didn't why because the sapa inca the inca king atahualpa just like the king of the aztec montezuma they initially believed that the bearded Spaniards were the Viracochas returning from over the sea. That's why they did not confront them in the manner I just explained. Wow. Because they weren't sure if these were the gods. They believed initially that these were the gods, the Vita coaches returning. Now, remember when I said that Pisado entered the Inca city of Cajamarca, found it deserted, and the king was, Atahualpa, was on the hillside with his thousands and thousands of, of, of Indians and his armies, right? When Altahualpa came into Cajamarca, that royal procession, he believed he was going to meet the Viracochas. And he wanted to see if they were really the gods of legend returning from over the sea. So you have a similar scenario in, in, in Mexico with the Aztec and in Peru with the Inca. This is why a couple hundred men defeated these empires. This is the reason, the primary reason. They believed that these were the gods. And the gods had their lightning sticks, right? Vitacocha had a lightning rod. Well, the conquistadors had uh, had muskets or whatever, uh, uh, arquebuses or whatever they were called, the uh, whatever uh, gunpowder firearms they were carrying. They were certainly carrying some cannons. So they were coming with the lightning rods and they had shiny armor on and they had you know, feathers in their helms and so forth. I mean, these look like the gods returning. They had the beards. They were fair-skinned. They were clear-eyed. The, the Montezuma and Atahualpa had every reason to believe that these were the Viracochas. They came from over the sea in these, you know, galleons, uh, these massive ships, sailing ships. It, 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 it had all the earmarks, all the hallmarks of the gods returning. You know, it's it, it makes me think like some of these middle aged empires, sort of the the crumbling of the golden age and the rebuilding were probably some really interesting times because you have the end of one dynasty, one empire, and then you have the start of another, and so you have these legends from the previous, and they're you know what I mean? They're influencing this next empire. It's not like now where you know you can't just roll into the scene. No one's going to think you're some race of gods showing up on the scene. The only thing that can happen to us as some Hollywood alien invasion, and, yeah. and that people would believe. But but back then, you 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 were it wasn't so far removed that these giants existed and they were building That's things. That's right. And so your grandparents could have mm-hmm. run, run into these things, you know, or had legends. But the and legends stories. were very real. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there was a cult of giant worship in Peru, a very real cult of giant worship. They were worshiping the dead bodies of giants. Well, so- we talked to some some guys in Afghanistan. That's happening in Afghanistan now. They're venerating these graves of the giants. It's the, crazy. Yeah, veneration of the Nephilim. Yes. That's exactly what it is. So I've been talking about two tiers of Vita Kocha. The first is the god Vita Kocha, the conventional, well-known god of the Inca Vita Kocha. And not just of the Inca, the Andes in general. All of the Andean people worship Vita Kocha. And then the second tier is the Vita Kochas, these 
mysterious bearded men who appeared in the Andes long ago, did these miraculous things, disappeared over the sea, promised to return, and then the Spaniards returning, and of course, the Aztec and the Inca thinking this this is it, this is the event, this is the second com the second it's coming of, of Contiki Viracocha. It's a prophecy, right? Yeah. So now let's talk about the third tier of the Viracochas because the legends don't stop there. The third tier of the Viracochas is that the Viracochas are still in the Andes. Rather, they're living beneath the Andes. That there's a civilization, an ancient civilization, these Viracochas, these bearded, fair-skinned men living beneath the Andes. Now, this is what the Andean people believe, many of them. And do you know why? Because one of you was talking about how, you know, maybe not too long ago or or maybe a hundred years ago, if you were living at that time, maybe your your ancestors would have encountered some of this. Well, try just a couple decades ago when not so infrequently, according to the Andean people. And when I say Andean people, you're not talking about your average Peruvian guy or your average uh, Bolivian guy. I'm talking up in the mountains and the villages, the Quechua people, the Aymara people. They will tell you stories of when the uh, the older people of when they themselves or their parents or their grandparents encountered the Bita Cochas who live in an underground civilization beneath the Andes. And do you know how they encountered them? The Bita Cochas showed up in their flying machines. Wow. And they will describe their flying machines to you precisely. They were shiny discs and the vita cocha in some cases there's well-known stories in the andes in some cases these discs would land in a village out would come these individuals who look very much like us dressed in strange clothing blonde golden blonde here they would come out they would speak telepathically with the villagers and they would heal some of their sick and then they would get into the craft and take off and oftentimes these people see the craft going either into the ocean or into the mountain. Very interesting. So you have this weird third tier of Bita Cocha lore in Peru and Bolivia and probably up in Ecuador as well in the Andes. And again, you're not if you pull if you pull a Peruvian aside on the street and hey, do you know about the Bita coaches living in the in the beneath the mountains? They won't know what you're talking about. But if you talk to the Quechua people, they will. And they believe that these godmen, the Bita coaches, have this underground civilization that they built the Shinkana, the general Shinkana, that that they had something to do with the megaliths. Some of the Quechua people will say that it was their sons, the 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 giants that did it right but generally things are attributed to the beta cocha and their offspring okay now this is sounding real familiar right so so you can find this this legend in the mountains off the beaten path with the native people this is the kind of conversations you can have with them indeed i was in the mountains one time in this far off remote location called okayi and it's in the central Andes. I don't even remember how I ended up there. I just was wandering around, like hitching rides. And I ended up like the end of the road. <laughs> like literally, this is it. It doesn't go any further. Mm. This is this is it. And then there's like a vast wilderness. And on the other side of the wilderness is, is Chachapoyas, for example. In this case, that's what it was. And so between Okayi, which is in the central Andes, and on the other side, central north Andes, and on the other side of Okayi, of this vast wilderness, by the way, it's a cloud forest, is Chachapoyas, the, the city of Chachapoyas. Chachapoyas, interestingly enough, tall, fair-skinned, red hair natives, mm. and lots of legends of red-haired giants over there. Mm. And, and in fact, in living memory, seven-foot-tall Chachapoyas natives, red hair, okay? So I'm in, in this little town called Okayi. And this is where I'm starting to learn about this stuff. And I'm with a, a buddy of mine. I was this is when I was 19 years old, wandering around Peru. So we talked about this before, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give you that was we talked about the jungle scene. Let me give you the mountain scene. Me, 
and my buddy Mike, uh, a friend of mine from Cleveland, Ohio. And Mike, if you're listening, contact me. Mike Miller. <laughs> um, Shout out to big Mike Miller. Mike and I, Mike was 20, early 20s. I was 19. I, well, let's start with Mike. Mike is really fair skinned, bright blue eyes, and his blonde hair, really blonde hair. But not only does he have blonde hair, his blonde hair is braided. Is he's got dreadlocks, and he and he braided. He wrapped his dreadlocks in white wax <laughs> string, and so he really looks like a Beta Coach freak show. And this is Mike, and then me. I've got dreadlocks too, but my hair is you know dark like it is now. Dreadlocks. I'm wearing a cloak half the time, and I got a monkey on my shoulder. Sounds like you guys had like a sweet reggae band. It just never started. <laughs> <laughs> you did well i mean we're like a freaking circus yeah, right? everywhere we went and we were wandering in the back country of the andes you're like no tourists no other you know like europeans or americans it's all the native people back here are you speaking the speaking the language at this point i'm speaking spanish but not catching okay so me and mike were the first gringos to ever set foot in some of these villages wow so we would walk into a village, little villages, and these aren't like natives. These are like Andean people today, Andean people, still speaking Quechua and so forth, but they also speak Spanish. And they have like electricity. Well, not in all these villages, but some of them have like electricity and, you know, whatever, um, but very primitive living conditions. And we would walk into a village and literally the whole village would just gather around us and stare at us. <laughs> I mean, I guess I would too. Yeah. So the description of us that I just gave you, and then I got my my monkey that they're all entertained with. And uh, uh, <laughs> somebody out there paint this for us, please. Yeah. It was running around, you know, running around. They're handing him like bananas or whatever, bread or whatever. And, and we're just sitting there and a whole village would just stare at us and not say a word. They just like giggle and, you know. And whatever it became quite irritating actually we were like a circus okay we were we were two guys in a monkey circus and everywhere we went but but what was cool was we we went to these really remote places like okai because because that's where the road went and then it stopped mm -hmm. and we're like okay this is the end of the road so if we're going further in this direction we're hiking and we were fine with that and also i'm wearing like these Junkies, which was always amusing to everybody. Junkies are they're the traditional native sandals, but they're the sort of the upgrade of the traditional native sandals because they're made out of tires. I thought that was like the the Peruvian jinkos, the large no, these the are large jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Remember junior high? Luke had a pair of jinko jeans. Remember? No, you you've never seen junkies. You'll see them in two months, but you've never seen junkies. Junkies are are sandals made out of tires, old tires. And only the native people wear them. Like only, they gringos never wear these things. Never. Because there's reasons for they, why they would never wear them. But I wore them because I was dirt poor. And also, I found them to be quite comfortable. In fact, that's all I wore was John Case. And so they were very amused by me. And also, I spoke hillbilly jungle Spanish. So it was quite an amusing situation, for them at least. You're like wearing the, and, you're wearing the Goodyear Air Jesuses out there, you know, with the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the Air Jesus. Um, and, yeah, John Case, sir, yeah. they, they, you know, the first month you wear them they would they tear your feet up but after that and you like form calluses it's like the the most incredible footwear uh like sandals so after i mean it's, it's freaking one, tired. one with the rubber you're good to go um so we're in okai trying to push this story along we're in okai and we don't know where we're gonna stay we got very little money whatever we're just we're fine though we're not like beggars we're we're, we're having a good time we're on an adventure and um we don't know where we're going to stay and word gets around a little town that we're, we're we're there and and long story short we ended up staying in the priestly quarters of a catholic church under the church oh. and having dinner that evening with the catholic priest with the priest the head priest of the church that was wild okay. he told us all kinds of weird stuff that happens in the cloud forest including they say yeah there's giants in these woods Let's no. go. And I'm at that time I'm I'm not yet steeped in the Genesis 6 stuff so my response is Come again? Did you say giants? There's giants in these woods? Like, you mean like big humanoids? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, some of our farmers sometimes find their cows up in the trees. Dude. I'm like, you're just, you know, this is a priest. 
that we're talking to and his, you know, priest and a couple nuns, couple priests, couple nuns, you know, we're having dinner with him at nighttime, you know, we're sleeping beneath this church. And like I said, in the priestly quarters, a bunch of bunk beds, there's nobody there, but us, me, Mike, and this monkey. And, and so, and these guys, really great guys up in this village, these, these priests, Catholic priests, and they're telling us all these stories. After I heard about some of these things, I was talking to the villagers and all of them swore that this was true. Like they all saw this, they're cows in trees. Hmm. They, the, wow. And I guess they, I said, and I asked the priest, well, why would the giants put cows in trees? And he said, just to, just to, as a joke, just to mess with us. Are they alive in trees or dead? They're alive Oh, in the trees, what? freaking out, sometimes falling out. And the farmers have to try and get them down. And, wow. uh, and I'm telling you, this is a pervasive story you hear. Like, not like my grandmother. No, I had to go get my freaking cow out of a tree because a giant put him in there. Are these the same people that say that they saw the, the aliens or the, this the, is the, okay. The UFOs? Understand where I am. I am, I'm up in the Andes between me and Chachapoyas, where all these legends of giants are, okay. red haired giants, okay, 15 foot giants. Between me and Chachapoyas is a virtually unexplored cloud forest. Wow. Spooky, freaky place, okay? That's where the context of where this is happening. So the giants are already a part of the, the not only the mythology here, but are a part of the fact of the natives of the Chachapoyas people who are exceptionally large at red hair. So I'm up there and they start to tell me about the, with the priest. And now these are Catholic priests, mind you, uh, start talking to me about the Puka Nyawi, the Puka Nyawi. That is a, a Quechuan word. It means the red eyes, the Puka Nyawi. Mm. And again, these are Catholic priests. And this was confirmed by other people uh, sounds, later on. Sounds like Bigfoot. The Catholic priests are, are telling us about all the legends and stories in the area. Do you, you have any, wait, I got to ask, do you have any Nacho Libre moments when you were there with, with these Catholic priests? I've had many Nacho Libre <laughs> moments. <laughs> they don't think I know about little crap out the gospel, <laughs> but I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. We've had many, many. Uh, uh, when I first saw that movie, this is a little sidebar. When I first saw that movie, I literally cried laughing because it was so relevant to me. Oh, but, yeah. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Um, so the puka nyawi, the puka nyawi, it's a Quechua word. Puka means red. Nyawi means eyes. Puka nyawi, the red eyes. Who are the red eyes? The red eyes are this race of beings that live in the forest. They're normal sized people, or actually they might've been actually a little taller than normal people. I can't remember, but they have distinctive features. They have red hair and they have red eyes and they are the gatekeepers to the Vida Cochas who live in the underground cities beneath the Andes. And so if the Bita Cochas want to meet with you or you want to meet with them, you have to go seek out the Pucanyawis, the red eyes. This is what they're telling me. And they told me that here's what happens. There's a place that you're sent to. And this, this all happens through the agency of a secret society, an Andean secret society called the, the Kapakuna. And the Kapakuna are this, are this ancient remnant of the traditions of the Inca, the, the great Inca, I'm trying to think of the word, the Grandes Almaltes of the Inca, who are the great teachers in this mysterious like priest class that's very mysterious in Inca legend. And so uh, the Kapakuna are like the modern day continuation of that line, of that society and they're like a secret society in the andes and these are like real shamans not like the shamans that are out there for the tourists these are like the real ones and uh the ones that are uh very very revered in the andes and so they're actually practicing the dark arts they're doing yes and yeah. so these guys are in contact with the pukanyawi and the pukanyawi are in contact with the vida cochas who live beneath the andes mm. And he told me all about it. The priests, they told me all about it. So the, the procedure is if you are accepted to meet with the Vita Cochas, then what you do is you go and, uh, you know, again, through the agency of the Kapakuna, you go and you meet the Pukanyawi and they bring you to this area where there's a bridge and they tie a rope around your waist. And then they have you go over the bridge. Actually, I'm getting this uh, mixed up. You, you, you have not yet encountered 
the Pukanyawi. You encounter the Pukanyawi on the other side of the bridge. So it's like the the shamans are, and they're not called shamans. They're called, uh, 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 shoot, I just, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. They're not called shamans. They're called something else in the Andes. And so these, I almost said medicine men. They're not medicine men either. They're, they're, they're let's just call them shamans like for now. Until I remember kind of things or? No, until I remember the, uh, I remember the right term here. I got all these Quechua words floating around in my head. Yeah. Until I remember the right term, we'll just call them shamans. But that's really, really diminishing who these guys are. So um, these guys, they take you to this bridge. They tie this rope around your waist, and you pass over the bridge. And when you pass over the bridge, the reason why you have a rope around your waist is because everything is different all of a sudden. You're like in a different environment, and you don't know where you came from or how to get out. So that's why you have a rope tied around your waist. And when you get on the other side of this bridge, and hey, I'm telling you what they're telling me, okay? That's, I, I, I don't know. I'm just telling you what they're telling me and what you'll hear all over the Andes, okay? And if you, if you go in the Andes and you say, tell me about the Pucanyawi, their eyes will get as big as saucers. Like, how do you, gringo, know about the Pucanyawi? Mm -hmm. How do you know that? Mm -hmm. so, so when you get to the other side of this bridge, you got this rope tied around your waist. You're like in another environment. Let's call it another dimension, maybe. You're in another environment. And you're greeted, you're met there by the Pukatnyawi, the red eyes who meet you, these red-haired, red-eyed beings. And then they escort you to have an audience with the Bita Coaches. That is the legend in the Andes, isn't it? I mean, it's wild. It really is wild. Um, because you hear it, and, and, I've, and I've heard this story by different people through the Andes, and Anselm P. Rambla knew about it, and he was surprised I knew about it. It's exactly the same. We both knew all the terminology, all the the whole procedure. We were, you know, and Anselm was deep, deep into this community well, uh, in the Andes, and very well known by them, by the way. I mean, it's it's the Vera coaches when you when you describe them, it kind of sounds like some of these descriptions you get when the secret societies dress up. They dress up in these robes and they wear this costume, right? Do you think, uh, except for the flying saucer part? Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, add that in, yeah. Uh, but well, but do you think that some of these secret societies might be emulating some of these ancient, you know, races of Veracocha type around the world? Are there are they kind of getting some of their dark arts from some of these? I, I think that the very simply, I think that Beta Coaches exist. Mm -hmm. I think they are members of the elder race That's living in the interior of our planet. Sort of waiting. That's what I was waiting for. This is what I was waiting for, Tim. And I think that they are possibly, uh, not perhaps not exclusively, but certainly a part of this faction is the dragon and his angels. Wow. wow. They are living somewhere. They're not like just these, as we've talked about a million times, these ethereal whiskey beings that just like don't really do anything practical. They're just like can morph into whatever they want. And they're almost like non-existent intangible beings no like these guys are living somewhere mm. they created a world beneath the andes their own domain where they exist and they have their saucers parked you know they've got their technology and they've got their domain and i think there's three places on planet earth where these guys are entrenched i would say the andes i would say the himalayas and i would say antarctica more specifically, beneath the Andes, beneath the Himalayas, or within, and beneath the mountains in Antarctica. Tim, it, you know, I can't help think about Shasta, though, and, and Lumeria. I don't know if you've heard of much about that, but we did an episode with uh, Derek Olson about this, about the legends around Mount Shasta and how there are doorways, and mm -hmm. there is the Lumerians. There's, a, there's an entire civilization that apparently lives under Shasta, and it, you know, take it for what it is, but there's a lot of weird stuff that happens on that mountain. And, and, and I know that we're, this in some ways to me is apples to apples. What we hear about the Andes is there is stories of giant, J.C. Brown, right, Nate? And we, and there's stories of giant, giant yeah. coffins and, giant, and, 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 a, and really a crypt for giants. And then there's this city under the mountain. And the Lumerians live there. And they were at war with, a, with another civilization that was... I don't know, under Russia. I can't I, I gotta yep. remember the right thing. Yep. David Politis said, Luke, that the most disappearances of people going missing is in Yosemite in the mountains. Yes. Dude, I've heard know. that. So yeah. well, you know, there's there could be a lot of things going yeah, on. Yeah, true. But but let's 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 Antarctica, the Himalayas, and the Andes. I like that. And the Andes. Like now now let's 
let's make a differentiation here, okay? Because you have a lot of these sort of legends that are new legends. These are legends that were created, not the ones I told you. Those are ancient Andean legends. This is like okay? 1800s, JC. I'm Brown. talking about yeah, 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 yeah. New legends that are created in primarily, um, primarily New Age type circles. Yeah. And like I believe me, I've watched this happen. Okay, let me give you an example. In Peru, uh, up in, near near Puno, up in the alto in the altiplano of Peru, eleven thousand six hundred feet or whatever it is, there is a place. My God, I'm my brain is like scrambled right now. I'm I'm trying to switch <laughs> directions here. All these names, okay. This um, is definitely a three parter. Um, I think there is a place called Amaru Muru, Amaru Muru. Okay. And it's an Aymara word. And I'm sure you guys have heard of Amarumuru. Amarumuru is this sandstone uh, rock face with this doorway carved into it. Uh, Haven't you encountered this? Yeah. And uh, and you see pictures of it online all the time. There's one like in Sedona. But there's well, like you this... see pictures of this uh, online all the time. Yeah. It's called Amarumuru. It's not really called Amarumuru, by the way. But that's what it's known as. You look it up online, all these new age people go there. It's called Amaru Muru. And it's outside of Puno. And it's supposed to be this supernaturally charged location and and blah, blah, blah. I camped in front of that sucker. Okay. And it was weird. I'll tell you that right now. It was weird. Okay. But I went to Amaru Muru and I had with me a Aymara translator. Because up there, it's the Aymara people, not the Quechua people, the Aymara people. And in fact, right next to that location is an Aymara village. They don't speak Spanish, most of them. The people I talked to didn't even speak Spanish. And the ones through my translator, and the ones that did speak Spanish spoke, spoke broken Spanish, mixed in with Aymara. Okay, Aymara is the, the language up there. And so these are natives, native people. And I asked the native people about Amarumuru. And they, they laughed. Oh, that's not what it's called. It's not called Amaru Muru. Okay. They have a different name. I can't remember it. They have a different name. And they say, I said, what is it? It's a gateway. What, where does it go? Uh, nobody knows. Another dimension or something. I don't remember. I don't think they said dimension, the Aymara people. I don't think they think like that. But another world or something. Okay. And then they begin to relate to you stories of their ancestors or their great-grandparents or their grandparents or their uncle or whatever who saw something either go in or come out. And in one case, I was told by this Aymara, this old Aymara lady, uh, dressed in all of her native garb and everything. She said, yeah, there's a story of a young man that that was knocking on it or something. I don't remember the details. And he went into it and he couldn't get out. And he was banging on the other side. Uh, and, I, and I forget, somehow he came out and he would never speak about it. He was, it just, he, was, he was messed up after that or something. Okay. So the Aymara people have their own legends. Why am I telling you this? Because the Aymara people, again, they do not call it Amaru Muru. There are all these, there's a whole mythology built up around this place about an Inca priest, Amaru, who went there and, and the Inca had a silver disc and you put the silver disc into this, into this round indentation in the middle of the, of the, of this uh, carving. And when you, when you put the disc in, it opens up a gateway and you can go to Lemuria or Atlantis. It's this whole, mythology do you know who created that mythology not the aymara people they laugh when you tell them that Hippie. who created it a tour guide created it and he's no, he's notorious over there everybody knows who is who he is and all the locals laugh at this guy and laugh at all the gringos who believe the story and they said he created the story to to make amaru muru into a tourist attraction so he and his buddies could make money <laughs> And so they created this whole mythology, and all these Americans go there thinking that this mythology is like some ancient Aymara or Quechua legend. It's not. It's literally fabricated for New Agey gringos. Mm. And they come, and they stick their head in the indentation, and they got all the shamans around them with the, what do you call those bowls where they where they run the metal thing around? It makes like uh, music or whatever. That's what they were doing when I got there. These gringos were there and all these shamans around doing the bowls. It sounded pretty cool. And and I'm and I'm walking up, me and my me and my team, a couple guys, we're, we got we got freaking tents and stuff. And people are like, <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, we're going to camp in front of this. What? 
Like, what? Do you know what this is? It's like, no, that's why I'm going to camp in front of it. I mean, I know what you say it is. And uh, <laughs> the Armada people who were with us up there. So we had a group of Armada guys that came from the village just to check out what we were doing. An old guy and some young guys, we were hanging out with them. We made food with them. It was really fun, actually. And they spoke broken Spanish and some of them spoke good Spanish. And it was a really fun time with these guys. And they're just, they just couldn't believe like that we're, we're going to camp here. Like you're going to set up a tent right here. Yeah. What's the problem? And they're all like kind of nervously laughing. And then it was getting like 730, you know, and the evening sun's going down and they're all like, we're out of here. See ya. Hmm. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where are you going? You know, we were eating and stuff. Oh, no, no. We're, we're, we're not going to be around here at nighttime. Like, why? Weird stuff happens here at nighttime. We're not staying here. You guys are crazy. That's what they told us. That's what we're here <laughs> the for. Of people That's village. why we're here. Like nobody, nobody camps in front of this place. Mm. But uh, I did. Mm. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> that night we got blasted with a massive storm and a hailstorm and like lightning crashing all around us. And the next day it was like a foot of hail on the ground and uh, it was crazy. And and we heard about on the radio on the way back to Puno, a freak hailstorm that broke out over this Aymada village mm. where we were camped. Right? And only right there was like localized. It was localized. It was freaking crazy. I mean, it was nuts that night. I thought we were going to get struck by lightning and get toasted up mm. there. But uh, we were sleeping in this tent. We were basically laying in water all night. It was uh, it was just, there wasn't a foot. There wasn't a foot of hail. That was an exaggeration. Let me be accurate. There was a couple inches of hail on the ground when we woke up in the morning. In fact, our, our vehicle got stuck in the mud because it was like raining and hailing. And it was crazy. Anyway, that was a, that was a total divergence from what we were talking about, a digression. <laughs> Just to demonstrate to you guys, just so you know, when you hear stuff about Lemuria and Atlantis, know that a lot of this stuff is literally fabricated out of thin air. And it's, I, Amadu Mudu, and maybe some people listening to me have been there, Amadu Mudu, the whole legend around Amadu Mudu and the name was created by this tour guide who pretends he's a shaman in Puno, <laughs> and he did it to make money on gringos. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's where Amadu Mudu came from. But the Aymada people do have legends about that place and they do believe it's a gate. So I just said that to demonstrate that, you know, you got to, it's difficult to parse reality, you know, unless you get. That's every rabbit hole on our show. I mean, every day it feels like people are either sending us messages and, and comments about, it seems like there's like a, there is some, some truth and then there's all these fake ones around it. Right. And it, and everyone gets sort of lost in their own little rabbit hole. But it, whatever you, you know, you want to go down, there's, there's a lot of this. They, it's like they, they take advantage of people who are looking and seeking and trying to figure it out. And then they, they take advantage yeah, of it. That's true. And why do you think, do. why do you think, Tim, there are stories of people being healed? It's not the first time we've heard it on our show. And, you know, uh, heard it a lot. These, you mean by the Vita coaches? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because they have advanced technology, and uh, there's and, and by the way, um, there's a location between Paracas and Lima. Um, those who are familiar with, maybe some people are familiar with Paracas, the that area where those elongated skulls, the most mm -hmm. the most pronounced elongated skulls come from. I I did extensive research at Paracas, and and uh, La Marcelu was down there with me, and Chase Kletsky, and and uh, Gary Haven, Jamie Walden. Uh, I had a whole crew down there and we were doing a bunch of stuff. That's a whole, that's a whole, that's another, that's a story for another day. We, that should be our next story time with Timothy Albarino is, is, is our Paracas experience. Yes. Cause we pretty much got kicked out of there by the Ica mob, but, uh, and we were looking for treasure and that's a whole nother story. Yeah. We got to put a pin in that <laughs> yeah, one. And we we got to do that one. Okay. Saving it for that Costa story's Rica. got UFOs in it's it. It's a, stuff. That's a Costa Rica so, story. So, <laughs> Join us. So February. that's a Costa Rica story. February 2024. Yeah, <laughs> come on down. February two through fourth. That's right. 2024. Yeah, we can we can uh, we can get into the nitty gritty of these stories. But uh, so between Paracas and Lima, there's that area is lots of UFO active activity. If you talk to the locals, they've all seen the saucers. The saucers come up out of the ocean. They go over into the mountains and sometimes they land and people get out of them. And in that area, as I said, it's almost always the tall, blonde haired or golden blonde, fair skin, clear eyed, Nordic. Interesting. People. Those are the ones who I 
denominate the elder race as you guys are well aware so i believe that that is an angelic race are they good guys are they bad guys are they a mix yes i, I don't know I, I i have no idea but i would suspect that you've got a mix of things going on there but i would suspect and and let me be definitive about this i know this is the question that's just pulsating in people's brains they want to hear me reiterate this i believe that the dragon and his angels these insurrectionary sons of god these apostate sons of mm -hmm. God, this angelic race, that they are inhabiting the interior of the earth, not some hellish environment with fire and brimstone and people scream, screaming. No, they've got bases. Who said that? Who, who, who said dumbs? Uh, I did. Uh, Shinkana dumbs. Yeah. Shinkana dumbs. Dumb they've state, got, baby. We, hey, we're still, they've got, we still they've got that got copy own, written. They've got their own dumb state under the Andes under the Himalayas, under the mountains in, in Antarctica. I am convinced that these guys have a massive base under the Andes. Massive. And I think they built the Shinkana, by the way. The Shinkana, the large, the greater Shinkana. So, Tim, do this for us here then. So, I mean, because we have a, we've got a million rabbit holes. It could be five episodes, I imagine. Put a bow on this for us. So, we started with the Spanish conquest uh, and a history lesson on the Incas and, and this tunnel. And then we went through the tunnel and and this purported treasure and it was the the sequestering of the, of this inca treasure and then the discovery of the tunnel and then we ended up with this veneration of the Vir viracochas right and so and then we're we're now with the elder race and the so can you brought us a synopsis a summary of of this and connect all the dots and wrap this up because i i think it's important because we've gone a long way here there's there's so much going on here we have pantheons of gods we have a viracoche figure who is a creator god and there's a flood and there's progeny there's destruction of the giants who uh, according to the natives built the megaliths and then you have it would sound to me a lot of like this viracoche is like saturn you have this replacement of yahweh with this you know, the serpent the dragon this you know pantheon and, and and it sounds a lot like the the, the apostate as you would say the apostate sons of god those the, those rebellious mm -hmm. angels mm -hmm. and then a connection to this place right because there is the mythology and the lore and the megaliths and the evidence but i don't want to do this for you because i i think there's there's so much brilliance in in this lesson and and i want you to tie, I'll tie it up in a way that you can well I just took all the clothes out of the drawers and yeah. threw them all over the ground. Now you want me to fold them up yeah, neatly just, and put them away? Well, it, relatively <laughs> speaking, maybe throw them in a duffel bag. Maybe just throw them all in a duffel bag, but just you know, orderly. Well, let me let me point out that, um, and your listeners have probably connected these dots already. That the Vida Cochas in in the Andes are equivalent to the to Quetzalcoatl in Central America and yeah. his cohort and his consort. Mm -hmm. who where did they go when they departed they departed over the sea right so those are the those are the vita coaches of the uh, let's say of the aztec the maya and uh certainly the aztec those are the equivalent though it's the same people mm -hmm. it's the same thing it's the same it's the same tradition it's the same mythology but it's it's cast con in the cultural context of the aztec as opposed to the inca in regard to wrapping all this up in a neat bow i'm not sure i can I would say that my opinion here is that I don't know. When you ask me about the, the Bita Cochas appearing in the Andes in a time of chaos after a great cataclysm, and they went through the village villages teaching, and in every case, what they're teaching is it's messianic, it's reminiscent of Christ, actually, what 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 they're teaching, to love one another, to treat each other amicably and so forth. And and he's healing the sick and giving literally, they That's say, sick. giving sight to the restoring sight to the blind. Okay. It's very messianic. Is it possible? Now, the Mormons, by the way, believe yes, this sounds that very. Was, they're very Mormon. Well, the Mormons yes. believe that this legend is referring to Jesus. Right. That Jesus appeared to the Indians. Yes, that's the LDS. That's possible. Hey, that's possible. That is possible. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is living under the Andes, flying around, flying saucer. No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that would be a different group, but they would look very, very much like. Christ, they would look uh, Christ-like in terms of their appearance, bearded men, and so forth. But I, I don't know. My answer is I have no idea. Okay, I have no idea. Graham Hancock believes that 
these are the survivors. These were the survivors of the civilization that was destroyed in the cataclysm, specifically the Younger Dry's Impact event, that these were the survivors of Atlantis and the other high civilizations and that they were going around and this is the osirian myth by the right. way going around civiliza civilizing people now hmm. we're are, are we talking about what i call the 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 exiles of atlantis i came up with this term to refer to p potential survivors of the flood uh, either human survivors or we're talking about um, maybe some s members of the elder race or something somebody uh, going around, or or don't discount the possibility that these are in fact angelic beings sent by God to help the human race civilize and recover uh, from 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 the flood or whatever. Okay, all options are on the table, and people like to come in and say, "No, it's this," or "No, it's that." Exactly, and it's like, no, nobody really knows. And why shouldn't all options be available? Everything doesn't have to always be the bad guys. Sure, yeah. they're not in control. Yeah, they're not the ones who are in control. Okay, God is in control. The kingdom of heaven and the King of heaven. Make no mistake about it. He is in control, and he's operating in the earth just as much, if not more, than the bad guys. And so he's got his emissaries and his agents out there doing uh, on on mission for the kingdom of heaven. Make no mistake about it. No, I, I would add in that, like, if we look at the Muslim world right now, there are more conversions and more conversion stories about people having Jesus appear to them in a dream or a vision and convert them. And these are these are, I mean, it is wildfire. These these are commonplace. And so when people talk about like the idea that that. This is always the thing, right? Like if God, there's this, there's this argument, right? Like, well, if God really cared about, what about the, what about the uh, you know the natives in Papua New Guinea? You know, they never hear the gospel, and it's like, man, God, oh, is, they do. God is converting people in dreams. Uh, you know, there's another story. Uh, I'm not going to say. It. I'm not going to talk about it. This is a Costa Rica story. Yeah. Okay. No, but this I, is a jungle story about <laughs> natives who were visited by Christ, who I yes. know personally. Um, Dude, that's a Costa Rica story, uh, and I, and I can't wait to hear it. But I mean, I. We limit a limitless God when we say that, like, and I think this is a two sides of the same coin, Tim. It, it, this is another conversation for another day, but I think there's that we limit a limitless God, saying that God, is, why, why wouldn't he, he if he desires all to come to him? One and two, it's also a drive for us for evangelism. If we care enough about people hearing the gospel and I'm worried about people not hearing it, then that should be a drive in your own heart to be like, what are we doing? To spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. I think it's, too, it's a two-sided coin. But I, when we talk about ancient times, I, I like your argument in some ways. I mean, I, we do accredit a lot to the darkness saying, well, this is, you know, this is the, you know, these, the it very well could be the could be. some of the entities of De the Deuteronomy 32 sort of worldview where you have these, these Elohim over the nations, right? Who then get corrupted because they get worshipped. And then you have these, these deities, right? And this pantheon of gods, this is, this is, this is everywhere on the planet i like the idea too that like that maybe perhaps the good guys are also out there working I, and 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 and, well, and, and, and it's, I like it's hard for people it, it's hard it is hard but because I, I, they I think, they don't have it it's not in the bible so they sure well it is well the internet well, greater those who are with us well, I, I love the greater idea. those who are with us and those who are against us and that means that means more numerous and uh, the agents of the kingdom are operating in the earth for sure. And the kingdom and, of heaven uh, is maybe, advancing. Maybe even to a greater extent in terms of traversing the skies, let's say, on mission from the king of heaven doing what? I don't know. I have no idea. But everything is not evil, okay? Let me throw something at you. I don't know who the Vita Koshes are. I don't know what to make of that legend exactly. Obviously, it's, it, it smacks of, of the Book of Enoch, mm -hmm. Genesis 6 affair. Obviously, but let me throw a wild card in here, and, it. and and it looks messianic. It looks like maybe did Jesus appear to the Indians? You know what? That'd be great if that was the case. Uh, but what about Melchizedek? Mm -hmm. What about the order, the priesthood of Melchizedek? I like Melchizedek, this. this mysterious character who has no beginning of of days or whatever that means. You know, what well, he's a priest means. king. But which is, which is and remember, Israel he's at, have, he's, right? he's around after the flood. 
you know, Abraham encounters him and, and, and we get this inclination that, that this guy's really old. Maybe not. Maybe there's some ways to interpret this story, uh, interpret this figure. Maybe it doesn't mean exactly in the Hebrew, the air or the Aramaic exactly that he's, you know, really old. Maybe it means something else. I don't know. I haven't done any research into it, but it's just a wild card thought. What if there's an order of Melchizedek in the earth? And and part of their mission was to help civilization restart after the flood. Civilization is not evil. Civilization comes from the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. Civilization itself is inherited. We inherited we inherited it from the civilization that predates us, namely the kingdom of heaven. It's yes. not evil. So, like the idea that beings would be going around and and teaching and civilizing mankind. It's not just the bad guys who teach mankind. Mm-hmm. Not just the bad guys, it's the good guys who teach mankind also. In fact, there's traditions, uh, and these are extra-biblical traditions, but there's extra-biblical traditions that talk about the angels helping Noah build the ark. There's extra-biblical traditions about angels helping human beings do things, and they, yeah. and, and indeed they do help. They busted uh, uh, Peter out of jail. Right, so I mean, you point this yeah, out. Yeah, that's how that's so- how the that's how the Noah movie went, the Russell Crowe version, right? The 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 watchers were trying to oh the, yeah the rock oh, yeah guys, they were stupid rock guys well they yeah, they were what well, yeah. he was more of an artist they were they were angels encrusted in the earth because they had sinned right so they were trying okay. they were trying I never to put that together they were trying to be redeemed so they helped Noah build the ark I think it's just an it's it's an artistic version of it but 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 you know I was thinking about this Tim uh, just to, maybe I can put a bow on this you go to the like our for our first episodes you said I I remember. He said, I was going to the jungle because I had a burning desire to have an encounter with God. And you go to these places with your friend and you hear these priests telling you stories of giants in the woods and it, it alters your life. I mean, if you don't have these experiences, you don't read the Bible the same. You don't go on these journeys around the world. I mean, you did have an encounter with God. I mean, you he literally told you what your life is going to be like. Like, you're going to have these experiences. That's true. Uh, that was in the jungle. That wasn't in Okai, but I did have a precursor encounter in Okai. That was really weird. That's for another day yeah. or for Costa Rica. So no, but- remind me of that. There's a story related to Okai because we went up into the cloud forest uh, and uh, uh-huh. that was interesting. And so, and that was sort of the precursor to what you just said. That event set me on the path to and where I ended up deep in the Amazon and I had this in, in very interesting encounter deep in the Amazon so but this set me on the path for that this was like the beginning of that uh, up in Okai so it's all very interesting no, and there's a lot more stories there's a lot more things I can say <laughs> about the path of Vitacocha, Tauri, Punku, Machu Picchu uh, a lot more I could say about these this the legends regarding the Vitacochas the under the, the flying saucers encounters people have it's just and, and you know what? You'd never really find much of this out unless you spent time with the Quechua and the Aymara peoples. Because again, the younger people, the people who just live in the cities, they don't know any. They don't know this. These are the old legends. And uh, I love getting into remote areas. And the first thing I love to do is to seek out some some old timers to sit around with, smoke some mapachos, and which, yeah. by the way, is not weed. It's just really crappy tobacco. Um, <laughs> Real and, dry. And, Real and dry shoot tobacco. the breeze and talk about weird stuff. Talk about blurry stuff yeah. with with uh, old timers in the Andes. That's what I like doing. Well, That's what I liked doing. Yeah. And just to reiterate, you know, you want to put a bow on this. Come to costa rica that's right <laughs> there's the boat there you go and i, I love I, mean, it. I love it i was gonna say real quick though we, we i think we get a lot of messages specifically after your episodes a lot of people email us and i and i often tell people i'm like you know it's easy to sit in a in an office your whole life and read books but i what i appreciate about you tim is you've been to these places and you've talked to these people and that really shapes how you read the bible and how you understand these biblical stories because you have to travel the world sometimes in order and be in some of these places and have these experiences to for some of these biblical stories to make sense in a different way. And some people are so judgmental, they think, oh, well, you know, it's just weird theology and stuff. And it's like, well, I mean, the same thing happened to me when I was in when I was a musician. I started traveling and being in all these places. You know, I got to go to 15 countries or so. It can't, it changes you because you're there, you're in a place, you see this Mm -hmm. firsthand and it's not like, oh, let's just sit around and and in church service every Sunday and talk theology. But, you know, some of these pastors are so, they're so close minded to some of these topics. And and, and on our show, a lot of people are, they, they push back because it just, 
it's like you said at our conference, your paradigm is is so rigid and when it's forced to expand, it breaks. And uh, I just like our episodes with you because because you bring that firsthand experience that you know I haven't been able to travel to some of these these places more like uh, major first world countries. I haven't got to the third. I haven't got out in the the middle of nowhere and and got. I mean, you've, I'm sure it just was wild and weird. In two months, <laughs> in two months, you will be with me in some of these places, though. No, We're going. Uh, you know, this is good because now this is a primer for you guys. I mean, when we go up there to Cusco and and uh, you're going to see the Quechua people, you'll see. You know, maybe I'll. You know, maybe this is this is kind of giving me an idea. Maybe I'll I'll grab some of these Quechua people up there who know the Quechua history of Sacsayhuaman, mm. and we'll get the Quechua history of Sacsayhuaman in the on the record or something like that up there, which is uh, totally different than the mainstream archaeological story. So, but uh, but it all proves the yeah. biblical narrative. It all. It's all encouraged your faith, giving you more trust in Christ and not less. Look, look, wherever I go, whatever I do, whatever I encounter, at the core of who I am is I am a follower of Christ. I believe in the gospel of Christ. I believe in the the death, the burial, and the bodily res- resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I believe he is the king of heaven, the savior of mankind, the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer of the human race. That never changes. Nothing ever alters that. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me who the beta coaches are. It's not going to change the gospel. It's it, I just, whatever reality is, it is. I don't have to try and take things and smash them into like a box. I don't have a Nephilim box in which everything that I encounter has to fit into a Nephilim box. Everything's got to be a Nephilim. Yeah. Or is it, no, I have a, a big question mark. I only, I've only i only been alive for 40 years and only investigating, deeply investigating stuff for 15, 20 of those years in a very short lifespan. Even if I live 100 years, it's a very, very, very a short period of time to be alive on planet earth and we we're confronted with the enormity of the universe let alone the earth itself and these ancient things that have been going on long before we showed up so to come in and think oh i've got this box that i've created and all these things are going to fit into my box that is a mind that is not going to be very enlightened uh, because you everything is going to be pushed into a box Uh, and none nothing is going to ever uh, nothing is going to ever change my allegiance to the King of Heaven mm. or to the or or my faith in the Gospel of Christ because it is the foundation for everything. Mm-hmm. And but at the same time, I don't have neat boxes. Yeah, you know, I've got my own theological perspectives, as people know, the elder race and all this kind of stuff. I talk about all the time. I, I, but I got a big box sitting over here on my desk with the, you know, metaphorically speaking, and it's just a big question mark. It's empty and it's big. And it's like, there's a whole, there's more I don't know than I do. Mm-hmm. There's, and I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Tom Horn, if you're L.A. Marsuli, if you're Steve Quell, if you're Chuck Missler, if you're Michael Heiser, there's way more that you don't know than you do. Yeah. Right. Way more. What you know is infinitesimal. What you know about anything, about anything. What we know is infinitesimal. Yeah. So there's way more com- complexity than we can even wrap and, our heads around. And and you e- know what? E- I am emb- I embrace the complexity. I was like, even less than that, infinitesimal. If you host boy creatures, so just <laughs> throwing it out there. I have to show you guys also before we go. I bought this the other day. I thought you would appreciate it. Do you see what it says? This is a that this is an official Forest Service cup. I like to buy Forest Service gear here in Montana because it supports the Forest Service, yeah. you know, the state parks and stuff, and uh, or specifically the Forest the Forest Service. And I got I buy T shirts Forest Service. So I saw this cup and I thought I got to get this. So you see what it says? Uh-uh. I see. If I don't think you can see it. Can you see it? Can you see it? So it's for, that's an official for Forest Service. Yes, cup. Service. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a Montana. Forest Service Sasquatch Department. Say, hey, I love it. The quiet thing well, out loud, Tim. Yeah, well, <laughs> just I, I love it because when everything you're saying reminds me of like when I started listening to Sasquatch stories, and you hear enough of them, and eventually it it blows out that box. You know, Bigfoot does so many weird things, and there's so much weird stuff, and so many of these these science guys, they just can't. It's like they can get into the the Sasquatch topic, but then they're stuck there. And they just rail against anybody who goes outside of that box. And it's like, well, if you host a show like this and you hear enough of these stories about this creature, eventually 
Yeah, you're going to encounter weird, unexplainable things. It, it just has to grow. And I, th- yeah, and I think every- I agree. I think we try to create a place here on Blurry Creatures where people can come in and tell us their weird stuff, and Luke and I don't push back a lot. And that's just kind of what we do. And some people get- I can tell you one box I don't have. I don't have a box that says supernatural. And I'll tell you why real quick, because I believe there's one truly supernatural being inside of created order, and that is the Son of God, Mm. through whom, by whom, and for whom all things were created, and in whom all things consist. That is the supernatural being. Everything else in created order obeys the laws of nature, the laws that are put into place. And so, so outside of the Son of God Himself, who can walk on water, who can make eyeballs grow in the sockets, who can who can calm the storm, outside of that, by the way, those are all indications of who He is. He is the Maker. He manipulates matter and energy however He wants. Outside of Him, everything else has to operate within the laws of nature. And so that's why I think that, you know, at some point, technology becomes indistinguishable from magic. And, uh, or you might say indistinguishable from supernatural. So mm. I'm not ever satisfied with a supernatural explanation. That's just a big fat question mark for me. Like, okay, supernatural doesn't really mean anything to me. What is really going on? And I may not ever find out. But like I said, I just want to say that at the end here, just so that people can understand that there's a level of complexity to to created order and to the beings that reside within it that I think you're never going to understand it, but you can embrace it. You can embrace the complexity. Now, I'm not talking about losing faith in Christ. We've already established that that's not the case. I'm just talking about embracing the embrace the weird, embrace the complexity. Yeah, and uh, and that's what's really cool about your guys' show. You guys embrace the weird. And you embrace the complexity. And you guys have dueling opinions on your shows that if you were to take all of the different opinions and, and theological positioning and so forth, and you were put to, to like put them on a table, you would just have a big contradiction. But I think that's really cool because you're not telling people what to think. You're just giving them a buffet mm-hmm. and a spoon. Yep. yep. I hope, and uh, and, and I think it's a that good that's buffet. really very unique about you guys, and I and I commend you for that. And uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun in uh, Peru sure, and then Costa Rica. We well, thanks. We I, I like it. I, just like the Veracoaches, I have always been here. Right? Is that kind of what you were saying in this episode? They were always here. They never left. They just went under in, under the mountain. The weird has always been here. Right, Luke? It's always been here. Never left. There is no supernatural moments. It's always been. It's all weird and complex well it's uh, everything yeah what i mean something is supernatural until it has an explanation you know then it ceases to be super and is only natural right so uh and i'm not saying that there's rigid scientific explanation for everything well there is but not not necessarily in the way we think. No, i like it 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 gets it helps people believe you know there's there's you know technologies that uh are are indistinguishable from magic from our point of view so and i'm getting i'm just i'm going off and doing another show here i'm, yeah. I'm just rambling no, and doing you know, another show. Uh, if we're, we're gonna put a bow on this completely <laughs> yeah the, we, we keep yeah, trying we, the, we the keep great... trying this is christmas there's a lot of there's a lot of presents under this tree hey but we keep putting bows on uh on things and they're not they're not they're not taken Listen, like it, it, we have to go back to the great philosopher of this generation which is the band puddle of mud it said everything's so blurry and everyone's so fake and you know what and here we are you know so yeah listen to my I, I love it i i'm i'm excited about costa rica i, I love these conversations because I, I i think it's these things are all worth thinking about and I, and I think it all fits as we if we pull out and look at a macro view of you know, as you talk about of the gospel and then of the Bible and the Old Testament and understanding the history of our earth and you know, our place in the story and also how, how that fits up in the, in the greater story. These are, these are things to, to think about, understand that and contextualize. And we don't have all yeah. the answers, but these are pieces of the puzzle. And, and I, I think it's important. And one thing I want to say, too, I think is very interesting what you said is that if we think about the kingdom of heaven, we know that God is the author of civilization. There are roads and buildings and walls and thrones, and and, mm-hmm. and it is God's idea. And so the idea that megaliths and these things may have been built by rebellious angels and the progeny of rebellious angels, these are still counterfeits of, of ultimately the Creator and, and and His in His architecture, right? And and I and I love right. to remember that all good things do come. From, all from good king. things. That's, That's right. right. And, all good things. And this is all about for the, all about the kingdom. So, man, we're, yeah, maybe there. As one of you said, I, I forget which one of you said at your conference. Maybe there's megaliths in heaven. 
I was like, ding, that's a great idea. Yeah, huh? That's like, that's a great idea. I think it was Nate. I, I think that would be so cool. Like massive, that. incredible megalithic uh, construction. So there's another show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, there's golden streets, we know. So that there's, there's weird tunnels under these pyramids and all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, it's going to be exciting. And I think that's the thing. It's like creation is vast and weird and there's some... There's a billion different things that we do know that exist, weird creatures and insects and all the things we've talked about. But so the, well, there's got to be billions of things that we don't know exist. And it's it's probably wild and weird. And and how how much more fun is that? I think this this reality that we're describing, which is an, more and more real to our listeners and us, is is exciting. And it's why would you go back to a stale, you know, black and white version of reality, and especially theology, if, if, if all this stuff is right there for us to, to unpack and unfold? It just just makes the gospel more exciting it, it's not s- sensationalized it's just more real you know i think it makes people's faith grow a lot of people get real like oh this is this is dangerous i'm like people have only been encouraged that's all we get that's all that's all the emails we get is people just more encouraged by what they hear so tim this is what we're going to try to re- replicate in costa rica and we always have fun sitting down and talking to you thanks again for coming on our show and yeah buddy you get the you get the weird out. We ask some dumb questions, and uh, it seems to be a good recipe. I don't know. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of fun together, and uh, you know, and that's part of the. Again, I'm going to make uh, one last uh, comment <laughs> on the Costa Rican thing. That's the one of the things that I love is being able to talk like this to a group of people, and then hanging out afterwards and yeah. sort of you know further discussion, hearing from people. That's one thing we want to do at this event in yeah. Costa Rica. Is we want to have a lot of time where people are talking and and asking questions and also not just asking questions but but also people can can expound on their ideas and stuff and it's mm. and that that's um i think uh is uh is kind of the, the, the kind of experience that we we, we want to join forces here you guys and me and, and in an exotic fun place and 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 just sort of this is kind of an experiment so yeah well there's a lot yeah. there's a lot more